for live. All right. Hello, everyone. This is a bit of a behind the scenes of a bunch of videos we're creating right now. And uh, basically what's gonna happen is hopefully the audio is transmitting from my ear here, which is why I have an AirPod in. Um, Tim's gonna be monitoring questions to make sure that there are no technical issues. And if there are, hopefully he will quickly solve them. Uh, we may have to stop and start. Basically what we're doing is we're recording this entire workshop. Half of it is going to be available for free on YouTube. And then the other half is going to be available uh, on Patreon. So the business section and kind of the, I guess, more in-depth part that basically if Tim's giving me a nod that everything is working correctly. Wonderful. That's just created an infinite loop of chaos and loveliness. Sorry, man. So we got a lot of topics to go through here and we're gonna try to get through all of them. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments and I will get to them or Tim will, Tim will help me get to them at the end of each section here. Um, this is the official, the pointer. Um, I don't have a clicker, I'm not that professional yet. So we're using a magic mouse, which is a nice workaround. Tim is giving us the nod. You want to, you want to look, look at your body smart. All right. There's a lot of cameras behind the lens. I wish there was a behind the scenes camera that we could flip back to. Um, all right, let me know when we're, when we're good to begin here, Tim. This is the, uh, the slow motion getting started. This is our beautiful studio here in Waterloo, Ontario. We have this projector that we really only use for basketball games pretty much. I don't think we've, we've done a few workshops. There's actually one, if you are a wedding photographer or really any sort of photographer, uh, our lawyer, Jason Hines, came through here to basically talk about copyright for photography. So there is a full, I think he did like a three hour lecture just on specifically like what we need to know as photographers. Um, and there were a lot of interesting tidbits in there. So definitely check that out after uh, after this workshop if you're interested. All right, Tim, we good? I think I'm good. You happy with that framing, Tim? I'm happy with that framing. You sound great. You sound great? Wonderful. You, unfortunately, the live stream can't hear the, the actual microphone. You just hear my... Uh, my AirPod that I'll probably learn to regret. Is that good? Yeah. All right. I think it's good. You want to stand that way for me? Yeah, right there? Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, cool, man. Yeah. All right. Beginning the workshop. So basically how this workshop came about is when we hit a certain Patreon threshold, I came up with the idea that I wanted to do a live workshop up here in our studio, I wanted to invite as many people as I possibly could, but basically life happened, things got busy, and then I rescheduled it into almost like a tour where we were gonna go to LA and San Francisco and a bunch of other different places and we were gonna run this four hour workshop kind of everywhere. Uh, but again, life got in the way, specifically the Nikon project that we're doing that's gonna be coming out just in a couple of days now. Um, we kind of got a little bit lost in that and that took over a lot of time. So what I'm doing is I'm putting half of the workshop up here on YouTube live as it happens. And then the business section is going to be on Patreon. So the, I guess the, the core pieces that I kind of promised in the original workshop are all going to be on Patreon. And it closes out with a huge section on uh, Facebook ads and Instagram ads and kind of how to change everything. Um, seven YouTube videos, there's seven things that we're gonna go through today. Um, I'm gonna start a little bit with my story since I haven't really officially told my story too much. Um, we're gonna go through lenses, tips for beginners, um, how to actually make money in photography, not necessarily just wedding photography, but kind of switching it up and working with whatever is available for work at the certain time of the year, wherever you live. Um, my number one tip that I have for wedding photography, easy posing and tips to book more weddings. And then we're gonna go into the Patreon section, which is uh, basically it's gonna start with how to get 10,000 followers on Instagram, which is gonna be hopefully maybe your first 10K, if you already have that achievement unlocked, um, you're free to use all these tactics and hopefully uh, gain even more traction. How to get published and why it's actually important to get published. The, I guess the, the big mis misunderstanding for me specifically is that 
Um, when I was trying to get published in the very beginning, it was a little bit challenging and I didn't know why I was doing it. And then I quickly realized the actual reason that you wanna get published and it's not to immediately book weddings, it's uh, a different reason. Uh, we're gonna go through pricing, although there is a full pricing course that is coming out uh, the month of February or that just came out um, on Patreon as well. Uh, hybrid coverage, there was a hybrid coverage course that came out in January. We're gonna go through kind of the Coles notes of it and how to easily implement it and get it running in your business quickly. Um, making more money, becoming a preferred vendor and the things that I've learned specifically over this year and Instagram and Facebook ads as I spoke to the beginning of this. All right, so Tim is here. He is going to be answering or he's going to be collecting some questions. So if you have any questions specifically for kind of the section of the video that we're talking about, feel free to plug them in. If you have anything that would just be, that you believe would be just a general helpful answer, um, the thing that you'd like to hear that you think other people could also like to hear, um, feel free to plug that in as well and we'll get that. All right how I became a wedding photographer. So my story goes back to, I'm gonna say I was 14, 15, and I was doing a lot of skateboard, snowboard. Um, pretty much I was out skateboarding, snowboarding all the time and also playing in bands, like really bad Blink-22 cover bands. And I started to take a lot of photos. I had this old, I don't even know if anyone would remember this camera anymore. It's it's a, a longer camera and the film is kind of this long. I'll, I'll see if I can even find a photo. Or like Tim, do you even know what it's called? Anyways, it's like this little cartridge you plug in the back of your camera and it was weird and you kind of slide it to go to the next frame. Um, so I used one of those cameras and shot a lot of just kind of skateboard stuff around my local area and it was all really terrible, but we had a lot of fun doing it and it was cool to see frozen moments captured and displayed. It was print at the time or I guess film at the time. So I would go into the grocery store and get my prints back and it'd be like, oh, cool, like that looks really good. That's a really good angle. Um, and I became a little bit obsessed with not necessarily getting my work into a magazine, but trying to emulate the photos that I was seeing in magazines. And with such limited gear, it was, it was a little bit of a challenge. Um, I really aspired hard to get that first fisheye lens, the first uh, like super wide angle lens, the first great lens, I guess, that I had a 50, which I 100% recommend that that should be the first lens that you really get for um, if you just buy it, if you just got a digital SLR. Um, but beyond that, all I had was a kit lens, a 50, and I had nothing to get those super wide angles and I was shooting on a crop body. So I couldn't get the shots that I was seeing in a magazine. Um, so I really aspired to that and I realized that it was very expensive to get to that level. So uh, what I did was I bought a fisheye adapter and I put it on my camera and the photos, they're really not that great. So I'm not gonna show any. And also print your work because one of the issues was that I guess I didn't really value my early work uh, enough to keep it around. So I wish so badly that I had a full collection of these images back from when I was a kid. My parents might have some, I'll see if I can dig some up. But for today, my journey begins in concert photography. So skateboard, snowboard friends turned into music friends in high school specifically. People started actually getting kind of good at what they did. Um, and I wasn't a great musician. I enjoyed playing, but I was definitely not any sort of all-star musician that if, if I was out there, I didn't really do anything stage presence wise. I'm quiet, introverted. I couldn't really get into the mindset of that rock star persona. So basically what I did was I just followed around my friends and just started taking photos of them. So this is my buddy Yashka. He was one of the groomsmen at our wedding and his wedding is actually coming up next year. And this is from like a little crappy club up here. And while it looks impressive or kind of looks impressive, I guess it's my fisheye adapter. Um, while it looks kind of cool, there was really nobody at the, at the show at that time. So the thing that I kind of enjoyed doing was making my friends look like rock stars, even if they were performing to like 10 or 15 people. Um, I started that portfolio. And as I'll kind of talk about over this entire workshop, really everything is a building process and everything builds upon itself. And even if it doesn't seem like it is that you'll look back 10 years from now and you'll be like, okay, that was like a key moment. I'm glad I did that. I'm glad I did that, that this thing unlocked this and that unlocked that. And that's what led me to where my career is today. So basically shooting that portfolio, getting that portfolio up and running, um, allowed me to go and shoot my first touring band. This is a band called a static lullaby. Um, if you're familiar with MySpace and screamo music, they were one of the, the key screamo bands at the time. And this is them playing, like a little crappy club for 25, 30 people in Guelph, Ontario, Canada. It's called The Shadow. Um, if you're a local of Guelph, you'll probably be familiar with it. It's a terrible place. Probably don't go there. Don't go there to eat, for sure. Um, but a lot of good bands came through there somehow. I don't know who their booking agent was, but they were getting everything, like everything that came to Toronto would somehow come here. We're about an hour west of Toronto over here. So I was able to at least find my way into a lot of spaces and 
get pretty close to a lot of really, really good and talented bands and take photos of them, which in turn kind of gave me a little bit of, I guess, leverage to use those photos to get paid at local shows or to get paid for doing press photos um, along the way. And that's kind of how that began. And then I linked up with a music magazine in Toronto. And I was fortunate enough to be able to um, get access to even better shows. So basically at the time, I was shooting skateboard, snowboard stuff. This is kind of everything that I was doing. I like it. It's fun. I have I had a good time doing it. Um, and I would do it again. I guess that's how you know when you're actually doing something that's valuable to you is that I would go and shoot the stuff for free right now. And it's still kind of a dream of mine to get up on those big mountains um, and shoot like that Travis Rice style um, crazy stuff, not to snowboard in it, but to actually just document it and go along for the ride. Um, so all of that kind of parlayed into music. And then I started getting bigger gigs. Um, so this is Dallas Green recording the Save Your Scissors video in, what is it, 2005. Um, so that was kind of one of the first big things that I got invited to. And I was able to go and shoot stills. And I'm like clearly in the shot. His camera man is pointed kind of right at me. I'm sure I'm out of focus in that video. Um, it's cool to be there and to be part of Dallas Green's kind of rollout career, basically what was happening here. There was a band called Lex on Fire. They were pretty much the biggest band, I would say, at the time to come out of Toronto. Um, they're blowing up. Dallas Green is the the happy, pretty voice of the band. That There's a screamer guy, and there is Dallas Green who sings nicely. He did an acoustic series um, or acoustic show, I guess, and then that spiraled into an acoustic album. And then it's really, that's what he does. That's kind of his career now, which is kind of cool. Um, and we were there at the very beginning just to capture his first music video. Um, and because of everything that I did, just shooting my friends and leapfrogging and figuring out that I can shoot for this music magazine and then using that to get leverage to get into places like this eventually got me invited. So that's all fine and great. Unfortunately, music photography in general, and there's a lot of issues, I guess, in photography when you're just not making money doing it and you're spending your time and effort and you're really spinning your wheels. And it's really, really challenging overall to just like to be able to get money for what you're doing, that you're putting the time in, you're putting the edit hours in, you're doing all the work, but you're just not making any money. So I was, I guess my closet was full of free t-shirts that I got from shooting all these bands. And kind of what I started doing was um, just getting my my friends, like, I don't know, like anyone that I could, anyone that was in the music scene, um, like Jordan and Laura here, to go out for a walk. And it would be like, I'll shoot photos of you guys, like doing whatever it is in order to for you to be okay with me going out and taking couples photos of you. Cause I don't know, we're like all like 19, 20 at the time. Nobody really wants to go out and do a couple session. It's like it's super weird. So I was able to just convince my friends, fortunately to go and do that. And from there began weddings. So I got into, I guess, weddings through music. So that means that a lot of my first weddings, specifically my favorite first weddings were all music based, um, which means that like somebody in the, was in a band or somebody knew me from the music scene or whatever it might be. Um, up here, my buddy Jordan, or Justin, sorry, <laughs> and uh, Ben Nechtel. And Ben Nechtel is a huge award-winning director now. He did Carly Rae Jepsen, Call Me Maybe, and a bunch of other videos that have won um, like Junos and Global Everything. Um, so basically, like just by shooting these little shows, now I've shot a wedding here, and now, now Ben kind of knows about me, and he's able to go on this weird journey of like all of this um, I guess like literal rock star fame and actually doing the thing that doesn't seem like it could potentially be a real job. And I get to kind of come along in pieces of the ride for that. So it's cool to see when your friends kind of just start exploding in a different realm other than yourself. Um, and you can kind of follow that. And you can pull bits and pieces from what they're doing into your success, even though you're in completely non-competitive markets. Um, it's cool to see how they market themselves. And I think anchoring yourself to somebody's like startup success that when you are both kind of like these people scrambling to make like budget photos and videos that when they start really accelerating, it gives you a lot of hope when you're in a place that you just don't, that you're, you don't feel like you belong and that you're not going to be going forward. And you see that. And that's like that little small kick that you need that one day to go, uh, I don't know, to go out and shoot and go have some fun. So I started taking images that I actually enjoyed. I pretty much parlayed everything that I was doing with my friends, just like walking around, shooting for myself, building my own portfolio. Um, and I was able to bring some of that into weddings and I was able to just kind of take, I don't know, at least like that color palette and the way that I shot weddings. And in the beginning, I very much shot weddings like I was just out there that I was just photographing specifically like my friend's band that rather than them being a couple or they're also a couple, but they're also a band. And this is kind of the same way that if I found this wall, 
I would easily shoot this with a band, regardless of how many individuals were in it. So I kind of just started doing that. And then I had to get a little bit more professional. Um, so I actually went to, this is kind of a gray area. And I went to a few just kind of portfolio workshops uh, that my friend Dave and Shar, they're Toronto photographers, or they were at the time, they're out in Australia now. But at the time they were like, hey, we're just gonna get a bunch of people, put them in dresses and uh, you guys can come in and take photos. And in the afternoon, we'll talk a little bit about business. And I went in and I shot a lot of my favorite images because I now stepped up from shooting people that were very much against their will to people that were now, I guess, um, like completely comfortable in front of a camera and knew where to look for light and everything. So basically by hiring people that actually knew what, how they appeared in front of the camera made my job a lot easier and made me, or forced me to create better images very easily. So if you're in the position right now that you're trying to create great images and you're just like, you're not there yet, um, consider spending a little bit of money and actually hire some people to go out and do a shoot. And some photographers will think this is a gray area. I'm just kind of into building my portfolio as I want it to look. Um, if in the very beginning, if I just would have sat back and let my portfolio run its course and just whatever work came in, that that would be the work that I promote. Um, I don't know what I would be doing right now. I think I would be probably the most amount of work that I did, I think was for interior, um, people that built cabinets and people that designed rooms. So I'd probably be some form of real estate photographer, which could have taken me down a unique and interesting path, but I have kind of enjoyed the path that I've been on. So, um, yeah, that's my story. Um, the real story is that, uh, <laughs> I kind of covered a little bit of this at the time that when I was shooting all this cool stuff, I was working for t-shirts and I couldn't book anything at all. Um, my issue was that I was super young and no one wanted a photographer that had no experience and no relevant portfolio. So what I did was I went out and I just started building that portfolio as best that I possibly could. Um, and when I look back at the time frame that it required, it was really only about a year. So it was, I would say a year from when I decided that I want to be a wedding photographer. I want to do this thing seriously until I was actually booking my first weddings or um, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but getting some free weddings off Craigslist that are a little, little bit of a nightmare. It's um, the, the best case is that you're shooting weddings for people that you get along with that also respect you as an artist. In the beginning, you kind of have to bridge this gap of just being the button pusher and you have to kind of do what you can within that environment to get images for your portfolio um, personally. So you're kind of working on two levels there that you want to deliver on client expectations, but you also want to be creating your future portfolio. Um, so what I did was I just traded everything. So if I came out and I shot cool photos of you snowboarding, my only request would be, I don't want any money. I want to make you look awesome. I want hopefully these to end up in a magazine or at least your MySpace profile photo. Um, and because of that, I want to do a shoot with you and your significant other girlfriend or whatever it might be at the time. We'll get to more of that later. Eventually, it all kind of came together. And again, I'm always in the process of building my own portfolio. I'm never just relaxing and being like, ah, like everything's just fine out that I am actively still building my portfolio specifically in the travel space now. So everything building process, work with your current opportunities and what you have access to. Uh, one thing that I've mentioned a few times that actually isn't really on the internet anywhere. It's, um, I don't even remember where I originally heard it. It's called the Rodriguez List and Robert Rodriguez, uh, director shot a mariachi uh, film for I think seven thousand two hundred. It says there two hundred and twenty-five dollars. Uh, so they spent seven thousand dollars on production of this film, um, and this would have been early '90s. So things still actually cost money to to do. And box office, I think they got picked up at Sundance and then thrown in like proper distribution and ended up making two million um, in the box office. And it's regarded as like the biggest, the smallest budget film to make the most amount of money. And what I took from this was that he was kind of speaking to his list of like how this all came together, that how did you shoot a movie for $7,000 at the time? Realistically, he could probably do it now for like 500 bucks. Um, that all he did was he took stock of like everything that he had. So he had access to his brother that had a gas station and this guy drove a bus and whatever it might be, you put it all together and you, you just kind of make it work. So whatever you, whoever you know, whoever owns a business, whatever spaces you can find yourself in that look impressive or that can really add to your portfolio in the beginning, just like take stock of them, go out and start building, build your portfolio and build, um, I guess the future of your life. Um, one last thing to end on in this first section of the video is that 
you kind of have to embrace being new. Um, you don't necessarily have to just like pretend. I don't like the term fake it till you make it. I think that if you're new, you can really leverage that and you can basically rely on that, that now when people see pricing and maybe you're priced a little bit lower than everyone else, that if they look, if it looks like you've been in business for 15, 20 years or whatever it might be, um, because you're faking it and you're coming up with all this stuff and you're building a portfolio to make it look like you're this, I don't know, photographer that's just been around for a while. Um, if you just relax and lie into being a little bit newer than everyone else that people will understand that and they'll be like okay this is why he charges this much and in the beginning for me specifically my big thing was that i kind of wanted people to believe that i was this photographer that was uh that they were finding this diamond in the rough i guess before they actually made it um to what they could possibly be and i was subtly reminding people in the first meeting to that like hey like you're booking me now but a year from now I'm going to be twice as good uh, when I'm actually shooting your wedding. So I think that that is something to embrace rather than just kind of, I don't know, faking it until you make it. Um, yeah, that is end of section one. Tim, do we have any questions? We have uh, many, many questions. I screenshot them because there's a lot okay. in there, but I'll read them out. Uh, in no particular order. No particular order. Tim is reading us the questions. Do you want to? Yeah, I can jump in, but I mean, it'll be through here. So. True. Okay, I'll read the, I'll read the question to you. I will state the question and the answer. Are the not or wedding pro programs worth it for new wedding photographers? Are the not or wedding wire or anything like that yeah. worth it for new wedding photographers? I do not think so. I have heard a lot of really sketchy stories about them, specifically in Canada. They are not good um, at all, and they're very hard sales. So if you are like myself and you're kind of introverted and you're afraid of saying no sometimes, you will get pushed into buying something that is out of the means of what it could possibly return. Um, I've also heard a lot of things about just like spam inquiries coming in that they just kind of like they drip a few in but they'll never actually respond to you and they'll never or they'll just ghost out because they just don't exist so those are my thoughts um i used them maybe five years ago same ish results um i would recommend spending your time and dollars into building your portfolio rather than um i don't know spending money for for advertising and if you are going to spend money on advertising it'll be in part two of this it's going to be up in march on patreon and it's like just Instagram ads, Facebook ads to get in front of the right people. And the most important part is to know what content to put in front of them. So you can't just like be like, hey, here's my website. Click click through. Here's 25 cents that you pay to Facebook to get somebody on your site. That you need to know what content will actually hook them once they're there. Um, because otherwise it's just going to be wasted money. And there's a million wedding photographers out there. That was a question from Scott. So thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Next question is kind of preference. I think it depends on the moment, but I'll let you answer it. It's on Wolf Street Productions. Do you prefer off-camera flash or on-camera flash for the dark reception shots? Off-camera flash or on-camera flash for dark reception shots? Um, it completely depends. I would prefer, in a perfect world, I prefer no flash at all. Um, that if I can get away with shooting ambient, I shoot, we're actually going to get to it next uh, in lenses. Um, that I prefer to shoot with an 85 prime, an 85 1.4, and I can get away in most situations. What I'm looking for is not necessarily quantity of light. I'm looking for quality. So if it's very dark and I have to punch the ISO. Um, there's a wedding on my YouTube channel that I shot, I think everything at 5,000 ISO. And looking at those images, I easily, as long as I was exposing properly, could have gone up to 10,000 ISO. And this is of course like using a newer-ish camera, not necessarily, it doesn't have to have come out this year, but really anything that's come out in the past couple of years is good. Um, so if I can get away with good quality of light, I am usually doing that. If there's like under eye bags and just because of like pot lights or whatever it might be, at that point is when I'll switch to usually on camera flash first. Or if I just look at a scene and I'm like, there's no way that on camera can actually take care of this, um, that I will at that point go to off camera flash. So over time, you learn which rooms are just basically need what and you don't have to problem solve. Um, I would say that's a big thing for photography in general is that when I used to leave a wedding at the end of the day, I would be completely drained because I just had to problem solve every single thing. And once you solve those problems, you get to carry that information forward to the next time. So you're able to just not problem solve and you can just keep working, I don't know, and not really think about it. Um, so ambient preferred, I would say 80% of venues I'm shooting ambient, uh, maybe 10% I'm shooting on camera flash and it's just a Godox V1. Um, and then off camera flash is also my Godox V1. And I will use that off camera basically if I'm in a big room and the head table's right there and I can't get this close because there's like 25 tables that'll be blocking. Um, at that point, I'll set a little off camera up here and then I'll go on a 7200 and stand at the back of the room and zoom in. So, yeah. Great. That was cool. from Wolf Street Productions. Thank you, Wolf Street Productions. They have a second question. Second question. Do you recommend offering prints for weddings? If so, 
do I look for a third party to do it? Um, so prints for weddings, um, I like obviously printing your work is important. I try to coach my couples specifically to print their own work. Um, and this even includes albums that there's a few videos on my YouTube channel that I really just didn't enjoy shooting albums that I would basically like after a full wedding season, I shoot a lot. I shoot 60, I did 67, 68 weddings last year and to shoot that much. And then to finally November hits and you're like, cool, I'm going to have a week off. I can relax, get everything that I need to out. And at that point I would just get hit with album orders and so many album orders would come in that they would stress me out and then they would all want them before Christmas. And it was very hard to get people to get back to me in a timely manner. And it was just really the sad part of my season. So now I just coach my couples on how to print their own stuff and how to do that. I think it's critically important. Um, I use a third party for when I actually do albums. I either use a Fine One, um, which is the very expensive leather bound book, or I use the Playbook, which is, a, I would say, somewhat equal in quality, but a lot smaller um, and a lot less money. So um, Fineo Playbook is awesome. Uh, Fineo One is awesome for display books. And uh, we'll talk about that more in the Patreon section um, that's going to be out in March, but basically just like printing display albums for every single venue that you've ever shot at, um, that it's worth the $400 investment to build that beautiful album, put that in front of people um, at the uh, I don't know, at the venue when they're there, ready to ready to book their wedding. Yeah. All right. Great. Back Great. to Tim. Uh, one more question, we, or two more questions we had that I think popped up, which make the most sense. Yep. Being a wedding photographer, this is from Liv, being a wedding photographer is a big responsibility. Tips on how to defeat anxiety and just dive into the business. Um, so tips on how to defeat anxiety when it comes to wedding photography. Wedding photography is a little bit scary. Um, and you will get that adrenaline boost for the first probably, I don't know, like 10, 15 weddings that you shoot. Uh, and you'll get the same adrenaline boost once that wears off. Um, start flying a drone and you'll get that adrenaline boost back again for another 15, 20 flights. Um, or when you're trying to do something stupid like we did in Iceland where Blair tried to thread the needle through a mountain a mountain top and we lost a drone. Um, but I would say, what was the question? I just, I derailed myself with the- uh, uh, You're asking about anxiety. Maybe anxiety. anxiety. Um, so anxiety, I think it's just important to over prepare. Um, that if you can come up with a full, I don't know, at least a breakdown, even if you don't reference it throughout the entire day, if you have a shot list just for yourself, um, or even the, the easier route is on your phone, um, in your pocket, just have a bunch of poses that if you're if you're running out of poses or whatever um, with your couple, like that you can just go back to it. Um, so I feel like that relieved a lot of my anxiety on the actual wedding day. And then beyond that, knowing that one, I'm shooting raw, and two, that everything is backed up to two cards while I'm shooting also helps me relax a lot that I know when I'm shooting that even if it's not looking exactly like I put it on my website right at the back of the camera, that I know that if I spend a little bit more time with it in post-production that I can get it there. Um, most ideal is to obviously shoot a correcting camera, but in the beginning, it's like there's a lot going on and you just kind of have to make do and just get it done. Um, so I rely a little bit on that as well as offsite backups and multiple backups on drives as well. Um, if you can't tell, I, I go over the top with a lot of backups. I've even, I don't do this anymore because you can actually, Wi-Fi exists, but if I'm shooting a destination wedding, I actually used to either burn everything to a DVD or put it on a USB thumb drive and FedEx at home so that even if all of my gear got stolen, that in the mail would be all the images. So um, that's something that released my anxiety a little bit. And knowing that and knowing that, um, I don't know, that, that I have a list of things that I need to do and that I can kind of fix any problems that I need to, it will just take me longer in post-production. I think that's how I kind of calmed my initial anxiety. Cool. All right. You got this another question? This from Stacy Jordan. Last time, question. Stacy Jordan. Yeah. Uh, this goes back to flash, but do you recommend any flash diffusers? Oh, flash diffusers. So um, I have nothing with me right now, but if you, um, I'm going to guess in the off-camera flash, I have off-camera flash videos. I use big Octobox. It's over here, um, which is awesome if you're in a studio environment. Um, and it works really well, but it's a pain to set up and it's kind of annoying and really cumbersome on a wedding day. On a wedding day, usually what I'm looking for, and this is what the off-camera flash video and specifically the off-camera flash course that's on Patreon right now goes into is really just using the environment that you're in to create great and softer light just by bouncing rather than bringing in modifiers that maybe you have to put a little more power into it, but a flash like the GoDox V1 has more than enough power to really just um, like overpower any situation that you need. So if I walked into this room, obviously this is a nice case example, but if I was bouncing my flash off of here, um, that I'd be able to light up anything that I want. And again, paying attention to the three-dimensionality and just kind of the quality of the light overall. 
Um, so yeah, I would say I would say that. Yeah. What did I answer? You answered. <laughs> so I'm losing it. You use the quality of what you have, but are there any other specific diffusers you would recommend? Um, other specific diffusers uh, for I just like the phone, little I like the little little um, just Stofan cup diffusers. Um, I think that? they do good enough. They're just the little uh, ball that just goes on top of your flash. Um, or in Stofan cup example, it's kind of just a little square that goes over top of your speed light. And then um, for something that's a round flash head like the Godox uh, V1, at that point it becomes like a little almost snow globe. And basically all that does is it just helps get light more places and makes your beam a little bit wider. Um, but I think that bouncing is kind of the way to go that I rarely, if ever, use direct flash. So um, yeah, just find and figure out how to bounce things and just go out with friends or um, bring somebody over to your house or your studio that you would find yourself in on a wedding day. Um, I think just like using a normal house is kind of the best way to go about this because that's usually the time that I find myself in the most difficult situation that I have to come in and I have to overpower like bad pot lights and there's like a makeup artist light over here and there's like all kinds of stuff going on. Um, in those situations, in those circumstances is kind of easy to find because you just go into any house really or any hotel room and, and try to figure it out. All right, cool. The rest are just saying that they love you. People love you too. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, watching. So we're on a part two. Um, basically, if you weren't here at the beginning, how this is going to work, I'm doing seven videos here on YouTube. If you're watching the live stream right now, um, you're going to get through all of them. And then we're going to do a re-release from the actual cameras that we have up here recording. Um, these are the videos that are going to be coming out. Hopefully, you can read that um, over, I guess, the rest of the video here. And in the future, we're going to have a few Patreon videos. Um, getting 10K followers on Instagram, um, how to get published and why it's important to get published, pricing for wedding photographers, hybrid coverage and why it's important, uh, making more money, becoming a preferred vendor and what I've learned in uh, over this year. It's not like All right, that's fair. All right, technical, technical Tim back here. Um, and yeah, Instagram ads, Facebook ads and what we've all kind of been doing wrong for a long period of time. All right, once Tim's set up, we'll uh, get to the next section. <laughs> if um <laughs> what you're experiencing is we have this little gooseneck um iphone holder and it it works sometimes and is it working right now tim's loading up the feed all right so while tim does that i will uh, kind of begin this session and sorry if the framing is a little bit weird um primes versus zooms tim's uh, tim's coming in again <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay. Maybe restart them since yeah. we don't have, uh, after the long speech on backup, that we don't have backup cards in the actual cameras that are recording. A little stressful. Somebody forgot to bring SDs and that somebody, that somebody was me. Maybe. You live further away. I could have easily yeah, brought them. We do have a studio. We, we don't really use the studio here for a whole lot of things necessarily as far as actually, um, that's a risky, uh, it's just as risky over there. <laughs> All right, so stand by. Tim will uh, invest in um, in a good tripod for your iPhone. Maybe next time. That's a note to me. All right, and we can probably start and stop those again. All right. Cool. All right. So what you're seeing is a live behind the scenes of this uh, these videos that we're recording. All right, cool. So now people can see this. Great. Wonderful. That might fall. Sorry in advance if, if you guys fall. <laughs> Tim's going to tape you down. Again, I wish there was a behind the scenes camera and a live switcher. Um, although if you do ever want to do live streams um, and you want to do them with multiple cameras, you can use an app called Switcher and you can connect all of your iOS devices. So you can go from like a MacBook camera to your iPhone to another iPhone to an iPad or whatever, and you can connect them all and you can do screen shares. It's a really Really cool system. Right, so. this may fall, but probably not the All right, so Tim has officially taped everything down, <laughs> and we are good to begin. Uh, let me know when you're rolling up. I don't know. I'm going to call it 10 minutes. Okay, perfect. All right. Section number two lenses. Um, so I am section number two. Section number two, lenses, um, getting into lenses, primes versus zooms. I think uh, that there's a lot of debate on the subject of primes versus zooms. And while I love the look of primes, I personally find them to be um, not necessarily a negative cumbersome, um, that you, you kind of 
are limited by your options in that point. So I feel like you make better images and maybe more creative work. Um, with Zooms, I find myself that I'm just kind of a little bit lazy. I do not like shooting a wedding, even though it's totally capable of shooting a wedding with something like a 24 to 70. What I would much prefer doing is shooting a wedding with something like a 24 prime and an 85 prime. So my photo only kit, I'm going to go through, I guess, the variations because I also do hybrid photography coverage as well, which is doing a highlight film as well as photography coverage. Um, if I'm there only to do photography, what I'm using is my Nikon 24, uh, I would say 80% of the time. I know that I'm in an outdoor venue that I'm going to have no need for to be really wide angle. Um, I'll use my 35 and then on my main camera pretty much all the time with the exception of the ceremony, I have my 85 millimeter 1.4 G and I personally love the Nikon 1.4 G lenses for weddings because they really create something that's artistic and just kind of nice. It's a, it's a good feeling. I feel like it makes very flattering images in most light and well, something like Sony might be more technically correct that everything's going to be like that optimal sharpness all the time. I feel like these ones is specifically for me and uh, I guess for my taste, they make better images overall in mixed lighting conditions specifically. And since I don't have control over every lighting condition that I find myself in, um, that I have relied on those lenses for a long time and I'm super happy with them. Uh, again, this kind of goes back to taste that if, if you like the images from Sony, shoot Sony. If you like Canon, shoot Canon no right or wrong and it doesn't really make sense to flip and flop between camera systems because every two years you're gonna uh you're gonna want that new the new canon flagship or you're gonna want that new nikon probably not the d6 sorry nikon um or the new sony it's probably just about to come out um you're, you're always gonna want something new so i think it's important to just find things that you enjoy shooting um and for myself uh, I know this is a section about lenses, but for myself, I like shooting something with an optical viewfinder. I like the D850 um, and the D780, and I, I feel happy shooting those for an entire day. Again, no right or wrong answer. If you prefer shooting something with um, like an A7 III, like that's totally fine. That This is just my preference. And um, I guess that's kind of also anchored to my history as a photographer too, that I've been shooting SLRs for a long time now. And I just, I guess, like the the instant access to what's happening in front of me. Um, the one thing that I've noticed is that it just seems faster too, that if there's something happening that with an optical viewfinder, I can just kind of pull it up. And by the time that the, the moment happens, usually I can have captured it. Whereas with an EVF, sometimes it takes a couple seconds to wake up. So my photo only kit 24, usually on my second body, which just kind of hangs here and then 85 on my main kit. Um, and then a 7200, uh, I use the Nikon 2.8 VR FL or VR2, I don't know what it is. It's the FL version of it. It's super nice. The thing that I like the most about that lens specifically is that every single frame that comes off it almost feels like it's from a prime, just the way that the the colors and the contrast and the, the fall off of the out of focus elements in the background, it all just feels like a prime. So um, I like it because of that. But again, that goes back to taste. That if, if that's not a lens, if you can't justify buying something like that, and you don't like the look, like don't worry about it. There's no right or wrong to all things wedding photography. Um, my favorite lens, as I mentioned, is Nikon 85 1.4G. I think that this is just, uh, it's my comfort zone. Uh, Manny Ortiz, when we're talking, he calls it the introvert's lens. Uh, he basically like, and myself, that, that just that's a comfortable focal length. I like the way the depth of field falls off in the background. I like the way that it actually rolls into focus, uh, specifically on the 85 1.4G. Um, I like everything about it and that's kind of, I guess my happy place. The 58 is also good, but I found that if I'm a little bit, I don't know that I have to get a step or two closer and I'm just more comfortable at 85. Um, the other huge benefit to shooting an 85 millimeter lens specifically for a wedding day is that if you, I don't know, like if you walk into a room like this and you guys just saw what's going on over here, um, if you walk into a room and you, there's just all kinds of stuff all over that you can easily minimize all the background distractions just by having that razor sharp uh, depth of field that you have people's eyes in focus and everything else just kind of blends and it feels a lot better than coming in with like a 24 F4 or something and just everything's in focus and you have to be a lot more conscious over what the room looks like in those cases and you can cheat a little bit with an 85 or a 50 even or 35 1.4 if you get nice and close. Um, moving into my hybrid kit. So if I am there to shoot a highlight video as well as photography coverage, which we do, I would say, um, I actually did the metrics on Patreon a little while ago, um, or I guess last month. And I think it ended up being something like 65, 70% of the weddings that I shoot are hybrid coverage of some sort. Um, so I have a hybrid coverage package, which includes a two to four minute highlight film, um, that I shoot personally with my second photographer. I don't bring in a cinematographer or anything like that, that we just kind of do everything. And I think that 
at least for myself and the way that we tell stories, I think that it's kind of like the nicest way to tell a story that you have everything that when somebody sits down and looks through their wedding photos, that's totally fine and great. But if they can watch a highlight video that fills in, I guess, more of the emotional story with it, it really does just kind of take everything to the next level. So what I noticed was not necessarily that I was, I, I was basically just making my couples and my clients just way happier than they were when it was just photography coverage. And that is no disrespect to the photography coverage that those couples had received. It was mostly just the fact that they had a much better story. And a lot of them, especially in the beginning, just weren't in a place to hire a full videography team because videography, specifically at the time that I started doing hybrid maybe five years ago, um, teams were expensive. It was like to get like a good quality photo team in Toronto, you're probably looking like $7,000, $8,000, which is a lot of money, um, which converts probably to like $6,000 US. Um, it's, it was a lot of money. And a lot of my clients, they wanted video, but they couldn't justify that expense. So if I was able to come in at something that was, we were already there, it was just basically us just working a little bit harder on the day, staying a little bit more present and working all the in-between moments that maybe we would have just had uh, like a coffee break or just like sat down for a moment um, to just like be actively working all the time and to have the editing uh, process kind of like tagged on to the end there. Um, that eventually over time, hybrid, I would say that it takes me maybe two hours to edit a hybrid video now um, because we know exactly the clips that we want to shoot. And it's, um, I guess that's probably the most important thing that I've, that I've learned over time. Shooting hybrid is that it's just like, you know what you're going to use and you just no longer shoot what you don't. Um, and for hybrid to speak to that specifically, I know that I shoot all the in-between candid moments as well as basically anything that would end up in a blog post. So if I if I was going to do a blog post of a wedding, any of those images, if there's 50 images in, in that blog post that are ideal, um, that basically becomes my highlight film and I do all of those in, in real life motion. Um, so that means that, I, I don't know, blog posts, I usually don't include family formals. So I don't include any family formal stuff in um in the highlight films and it's just the way that we build them it seems organic and it seems to make people really really exceedingly happy so i am happy to have offered them and i i would I, i've been asking this for a while if somebody else knows of anyone that started doing hybrid coverage before uh we did please let me know because i until then i'm going to claim that we started this genre and nobody has contested that yet um so moving into a few sample images um Sample images, so basically like what you're looking at right here is from an 85 millimeter lens. I like this image a lot, it feels really nice. Shot the same lighting, the same everything with the 24, I went vertical, so it's a little bit different, but you can definitely see how things feel a little bit differently there that even though it's the same image, the same lighting, both images are nice. 85 for me just feels a lot better um, for a number of reasons, I guess, and one of them might be composition because the 24 composition is a little whack. Next image. Um, so 85 to, um, the 24 in this scene, it's a little bit of a different moment. The, uh, the lights are just a little bit different, but looking at 85, um, I like this image a lot. And this basically means to get a wide angle shot with an 85, I had to just take a little bit of a run and I don't mind zooming with my feet to just like go out and just make sure that, um, that I can get that shot with an 85 shooting with a 24. It works too. It's a very nice shot. I very much like the image. I like to have both. I personally feel the 85 feels a heck of a lot more romantic when you're just kind of um, as an out of context image um, that I feel like this fits into a set a lot better, but I feel like as an out of context, as a um, an image on a wall somewhere that this kind of feels a little bit better to me. Um, and I just like kind of the, the overall feeling of it. I love my 24, but I love that 85 a lot. Um, one of the things, I don't know if you can see it on the live stream, but um, one of the things that I like doing with the 24 is getting really close and getting that really shallow depth of field. So I'll shoot my 24 at 1.4 and I'll get so close that you really do get some nice depth of field. So as you can see the, the tail of the helicopter kind of fading off there, um, I really like kind of the focus fade of that. So um, that's the one thing that is specifically, I guess, my taste that I just really, really enjoy the look of that. Moving into my ceremony lens and the lens that I will bring sometimes when we travel, not a lot though, because it's really big, uh, is the 7200 2.8. I think that this is a key lens for specifically for um, wedding photographers to have during the ceremony. And if you don't have one, you can have a backup. If you have an 85, usually you can get away with it. But if you have a 7200 F4 in your bag, um, rather than 2.8, you're going to save a lot of money. Um, and pretty much just like um, one more example of it, but the way that you can just kind of zoom around different objects and you can kind of create different frames, especially if you're walking or if you're just out with a couple and like, I, I kind of, um, we'll talk a little bit more about this in kind of the full wedding walkthrough that we're going to go through eventually here. But 
by just having that lens that I'm able to create a lot of different frames very, very quickly from a situation that's like, hey, great lighting going on. Um, and I can frame that 10 different ways and give them 10 different kind of different images that all fit really well together. So for instance, if they wanted to put something up on the wall that maybe they're not just gonna put a big canvas of themselves, but they're, they might put a medium sized canvas with two other um, complementary images with it. And if I'm able to deliver those, um, I am a pretty happy photographer, I guess. So 7200, super helpful for ceremonies and just not being in the way again. Um, I'm a very introverted photographer. I'm a very introverted human. If there were other people in this room, I probably wouldn't be able to do this um, very well at all. Um, and basically, like by using a 7200, you don't have to be in the way of anyone. You'll never feel like you're blocking like the mother of the bride from seeing her daughter come down the aisle or anything like that. That you can be out of the way. So that is one of the reasons that I love the 7200. Um, but find what works for you first. Um, in the beginning, I borrowed everything um, or I rented it. There's a lot of services, depending on where you live, that will just ship you in a Pelican case or um, an Inuk case or whatever it might be, um, that they'll just ship it to you. It'll show up at your house. You shoot for the weekend, you send it back. And well, it might cost you a little bit of money to know that that's a lens that you actually want to invest in and spend your actual money on um, is, is an important step that you're just not buying something that's going to sit in your bag forever. Um, closing point on lenses specifically for wedding photography is that whatever your main lens is, it is worth the upgrade to get the best version of that lens that if you love the 85, save up for that one for, um, I know I have a video kind of about saving money and how to save money in photography. Um, I think for your main lens, the lens you find yourself using most, whether it's a 50 or an 85, if you're a portrait or wedding shooter, or maybe a 35, if you're a family shooter, um, it's important to upgrade that to be the best it possibly can be. Um, or you can even take it one step forward and start like a little bit of an equipment share or something with uh, a few other photographers in town if you're kind of all in the same boat and you want to upgrade but you don't really have the money to do it and if your family shooters maybe you're not going to be all out shooting on the same day um so you're able to do something like that but yeah so rent until you know what you actually want and then um go forth and buy it even though i love the 85 you might love a 50 you might love a 58 you might love a 35 don't take my word for it go out and try them all and see what see what works best for you all right that is all for lenses we're going to go to the phones here with Tim. Yeah. Tim has some questions, I think. I got some great questions for me. He has some great questions for me. I didn't come up with them. Tim did not come up with these questions. But this is um this pertains to like a wedding day. So Veni Vidivici. Veni Vidivici. Asks Sorry if I pronounce um, that terribly. Uh, do you do you do any backing up on the go? So during a wedding day, yeah. do you time to like back up midday all right so the question is do we do any backup as we go um i personally shoot with two camera or two two camera slots i always say that and I have to make the animation of the two cameras going into the one camera um we shoot with two card slots always so that you have your backup in there what you don't have backup of is you physically lose that camera or it gets stolen or something you don't have that backup um we don't do any backup necessarily on the day. Um, if it's like a big day and there's many different parts or we're doing a same day edit or something like that, um, or we wanna do a same day slideshow, at that point, usually we'll start downloading cards. But my strategy is that I literally just have my camera around me and I do not put it down. I do not let it go. That that just stays with me the entire day, um, regardless of how annoying it is or if I'm going out on the street in public or whatever it might be, that I am putting that in a camera bag and I'm making it all a camera bag to just, again, um, maybe a little bit over with all my backups um, as far as that goes. But yeah, um, so we're backing up as we go. If you're interested in that, or specifically if you're shooting a camera that only has one card slot, um, the most likely point of when a card is actually going to fail is when you're removing it or putting it into your camera. Um, so find a way, you can use a NAR box and you can actually just like um, go USB-C to USB-C and just download everything from the camera. Or if you have a laptop with you, get those little SanDisk solid state drives and you can download so fast. Like it's, I would say what's a 64 gigabyte card maybe takes a minute, two minutes. Tim's giving me three fingers. So maybe, maybe it takes three minutes total um, to download that card. And it is worth the investment in buying a solid state drive. If only for that, just so you can sit down and it's just done. And then you have that backup and also it's a solid state drive. So even if you fumble it around a little bit, usually you'll be okay. Um, and it's not going to go corrupt on you. Yeah, Benny Vidivici says you only have one card slot. So. Yeah, so yeah, one card slot. Um, definitely maybe get in our box or just bring your laptop with you and just connect it and get a solid state drive and um, hopefully life will be good. But again, load off by USB-C or whatever the USB in your camera is, if possible, because um, the most likely time for a card to fail is when you're pulling it out, putting it in. Richard Benson asks. Richard Benson asks. Will you be sticking with DSLR or will you make the switch to a mirrorless system? Will I be sticking with digital SLR or switching to mirrorless? I, for now, 
am happy to be using a digital SLR. Um, we have, I guess, through the entire month of January, we were actually shooting everything on Nikon Z6. So you're going to see a lot of Nikon Z series videos coming out. That is all for travel work. That is all for commercial work. For my actual wedding days, I am much happier to actually um, be on a digital SLR, which means something like a D780 um, right now, or a D850 is kind of the second, and I shoot it on medium raw. I don't need the full gigantic version of it. Um, so yeah, those are, uh, I guess, my answers to that, that I am happy on digital SLR for now. I feel just more comfortable using it. And then with an Nikon D780, when you go into live view, you basically have all the functionality of an Nikon mirrorless camera. So um, I'm a big fan of that. Sony R or Sony R. Canon R is also awesome. Um, we're going to make a video, I think, next week with Sam Hurd about that and about his transition from, I think he was, I forgot what he was shooting, Nikon D850 or something before. Um, he's since transitioned to the Canon R and he loves it. Um, as well as I'm going to do a video with Liam and we're going to talk about hybrid coverage with Sony A7III's because um, there's been a lot of questions and specifically questions that the main challenge for hybrid with Sony and even with some Canon cameras is basically the buffer time that if I take 10, 15 images really, really quickly, that it's going to take me a while to actually be able to record a video because it's going to have that little countdown um, that's going to be writing to the card and you can't start a video clip before everything writes to the card. Um, so Liam's going to walk us through a little bit about his process with Sony, which is traditionally, I would say, the one of the more challenging buffers. And I've tried every single Sony camera that's come out because I really want it to be successful. Um, but for hybrid, I just can't, I can't use it. Um, that It's just much faster to use Nikon and I've become very accustomed to being able to switch instantly. So um, I'm happy with my D780 as my main wedding camera right now. Um, I was super excited for the D6, but uh, as you all know, that kind of flopped a little bit on release. But uh, yeah, so we'll see what the future brings. Back to the phones, Tim. He says, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. Um, Stacy Jordan, another question from Stacey Jordan. Are there any fave macro lenses, 35 or 100 millimeter? Oh, Stacy Jordan asks, uh, favorite macro lenses. So going down to, I guess, the way that we shoot is that the less gear we can bring, if I can bring the smallest camera bag ever with me, I am the happiest. And using the Tamron 35, which is part of my hybrid kit, um, the 35 is just a really fantastic macro lens and it's very, very small. Um, it's not a traditional macro, it's not gonna give you like that one-to-one -one full um, like macro style, but what it will do is it'll get you 85% of the way there, but also give you a lens that you can use all day, every day if you want. Um, so we bring that with us and we just kind of, um, on Nikon cameras, you can just go into, I think all cameras now, um, you can just go into crop mode within your camera and get a little bit extra reach. You'll lose megapixels, but basically Tamron 35 to get nice and close. And then you're at your minimum focusing distance. And then if you want to get closer, DX mode, um, all that does is it just crops in camera basically. So if you want to just shoot it normal and crop it in post, you can, but I think to shoot everything correct in camera is kind of the, the best possible situation. And if I don't have to crop that in post and I can just crop it with a few button presses really quickly before I even shoot the image, um, I'm gonna do that. So that's our macro workaround for now. Um, and quite honestly, like we use it for ring shots and that's about it. Um, in weddings, I don't find myself using a macro for much else than that. So it, it's hard to, I don't know, buy something expensive to carry around all the time for that one single shot. Tim, next yes, question. One more question. Final one more question. question. Final, final question. From Jacob TKL. Jacob TKL. He finds that his Tamron 2470 2.8 is so versatile and fantastic. I'm guessing for wedding days. Uh, is this ever an option for you? Because he never goes above one point. He always goes above one point eight anyway for his primes. Yeah. So do you find that 2470 is a good camera for you? So the question is, um, Tamron 2470 2.8, the G2 specifically, amazing lens. It does everything that you could ever really need on a wedding day. Um, the thing that the reason that I prefer primes over zooms is simply because of the, the impact that every single image has that I find when I shoot a 24 to 70 that I'll shoot like at 24 and then you'll actually see this in some of the Nikon stuff whenever I tag uh, what millimeters I shot at that it, I shoot something at 24 and then 28 and then 38 and then 45 and everything just kind of blends a little bit too close together and I find when I shoot two very distinct primes a 24 on this side and an 85 usually in my hand that every single image is either a close-up or a wide and it has pop and it has something extra that makes it stand out a little bit more so that's personally why I like shooting primes um, that Tamron G2 lens uh, the 24 to 70 our buddy Marshall like I don't think that ever leaves his camera um, it's a fantastic lens. All the Tamron G2 stuff is really, really fantastic as well as their primes. And I'm excited to see what they continue to build because they're doing some cool stuff right now. All right. Cool. That's, that's all we got. All right. I'm very happy to see you and you're very grateful.
Hello, everyone. <laughs> All right. Um, I don't know. Any, anything that comes up, feel free to plug it in the comments, and Tim will uh, relay a few of them to me at the end of every segment. Um, and then I'll look through them later. And if that spawns any future video ideas, um, I'm happy to go more in depth and more into detail about those. Um, all right. Next section here. Do you want to reset? Yeah, I think Jeff might want to come in. All right. So we're going to be joined by potentially our friend Jeff Gadway um, on the live stream here for a minute. What we're doing, if you haven't been here since the beginning, we're recording this course. This is all going to be standalone videos at some point. Um, but right now, if you're in the live stream, you're just able to see everything as it goes right now. Um, Tim has abandoned me, and we're no longer recording. And unfortunately, I can't see any of the uh, the chat box right now. So we're going to hang out. I'm actually going to grab water. I think that's what I need right now. I'll be back in less than one minute. Jeff Scott. The most appropriate mug. <clears throat> Tim is uh, Tim is on a taco break right now. He's building a taco. I'm sure he'll come show it to you. I lost my remote. I'll be right back again. Expensive mug I got from Vistaprint. It was one of those upsells. I'm like, yes, I do need a Taylor Jackson Media mug. Do you want to show everyone the taco you just built, Tim? It's a very fine taco. Just a taco floating in a frame now. <laughs> Beautiful. You're so fancy, Tim. If you are, um, if you live in the Kitchener Waterloo area, which is like an hour outside of Toronto, um, there's a restaurant called Taco Farm, and they recently redid their menu where, uh, if you order a single one one human serving of tacos, it comes with enough for three people now. So um, cost savings. Unfortunate for Nick, I guess, who owns the place that maybe we're eating two less portions of tacos now. But yeah. All right. Want to hit record on the? Yeah. And then we'll, then you can eat, you can relax. All right. And we're officially back. All right, wedding tips for, all right, wedding photography tips for beginners. Uh, I'm going to go through the things that kind of helped me the most when I was first getting started. And hopefully things that will, maybe if you, even if you don't use them 100%, will hopefully at least inspire you to maybe work a little bit differently or a little bit more efficiently. Um, I find that, the more efficient that I can be, the better overall, um, as well as I have some just kind of moral boundaries as well that we're going to get into a little bit. Um, so if you just joined us, you joined the live stream, um, basically what's happening is I'm going through these seven YouTube videos right now. Um, these are all going to be released on YouTube. So right now we are in number three, seven. I'm going to have to break this in two days, Tim. Um, number seven is Patreon videos. So there's going to be seven Patreon videos going up as well. So we're going to do the seven videos out here, then we're gonna do seven videos on Patreon, um, getting 10K on Instagram, how to get published, why it's important, um, pricing for wedding photographers. And February, there was a full pricing course that just went up. Um, hybrid coverage, why it's important. Hybrid coverage course also up right now on Patreon if you uh, join up there. Wait until the first of the month though. The first of the month, um, if you sign up on like the 30th, you get charged again on the first thing I can't control. It's kind of annoying. Um, making more money, becoming a professional, or becoming a preferred vendor. Um, and what I've updated from last year, I've made, I think I did a podcast and I did a post on Patreon um, that's already up there, but I've modified and adjusted a few things and then Instagram and Facebook ads. And it's essentially, it comes down to like one awesome tip. So we're going to get to that over on Patreon. But for now, we got all seven videos coming up. All right. So lenses, cameras, speed lights. Um, I use the Godox or Godox. Um, I guess they were named after God and Ox and they put the words together. Um, so apparently it's pronounced God Ox. And that's what I use. Um, we've already talked about lenses in the last video and cameras. I'm just using either my Nikon D780 or my D850. Um, and then speed lights, I really don't bring any studio equipment with me to an actual wedding day. I find that it's just not, it's not necessary to bring full studio strobes or anything that I have one in my trunk if I ever need it. But 
it's, I feel like it was kind of the thing in maybe 2012, 2013, where you'd always have the alien bees up in both corners. And you'd like every single time the photographer takes an image, like the entire room just goes white. And I don't want to do that. So my, I guess, number one strategy and number one wedding photography tip is to have as little impact the day as you can that you want to be there, you want to capture it, but you don't want to change the the feeling of anything. You don't want to change the scene. Um, I've spoken to this a lot in the live wedding day videos that when I set things up that I don't, I don't want to have a bunch of like off camera flashes that are visible by people. And specifically during the ceremony, it's just such a pain to like be sitting there as a guest and watching these like flashes go off that everybody starts focusing on that. Or if you're a photographer and you're doing like weird stuff, trying to get like crazy angles in the center of the aisle at the front and you're trying to like shoot up between the bride and the groom. Um, I feel like that's just not a thing that is, is nice for a guest experience. So I keep the guest experience. I keep specifically the family experience, like the first row, at the uh, ceremony. I try my best not to block them, which is why I use something like a 7200. Um, and then also just like, having as little impact on the day overall as possible. Um, that also comes down to what people want the schedule to be that I won't like push hard to be like, you need to do this at this time that whatever the day ends up being that I'm happy to work with it. Um, I guess one thing that I don't know if I covered all in this, but basically like if I can have a half an hour with the couple in the wedding party total, um, even like 10, 15 minutes with the family, that's more than enough for me. I don't need a three hour photo session. I feel like that's something that I'm happy to have left in like 2010 um, that the faster I can get everything done, that I just, you just kind of figure out what works and you're able to do that very quickly. So to have as little impact on the day as possible and to not make the wedding a photo shoot that they should be there to have a wedding and not there just to have nice images taken. Um, number two is that candid is, is the best. Um, this is something that I lead with in all my marketing materials and it's one, how I operate because I'm introverted and quiet and I, I don't want to be that extroverted personality. Um, if you do want to see somebody that's amazing, and very extroverted and very out there and able to do all of the things that I cannot uh, check out Jerry Chionis. Uh, Jerry Chionis is, I don't, I don't, he's kind of the, I would say like the top five wedding photographer on every single list ever. Um, so he's, he's an awesome dude. He is a very extroverted person when he's at a wedding day that he knows he's the, he's the guy telling all the jokes, getting everybody to laugh and smile and creating real moments. Um, I'm a, not able to do that. Um, I feel like Jerry also that he has a balance that he's, quite quiet when he's not in that position that when he's not on stage or when he's not at a wedding that he can really just not be that character at all uh, but he can turn it on when he needs to and it's very authentic and it's very him in the moment um, which is really really cool so he has um, a bunch of videos online you can search for him as well um, my strategy quiet candid I don't pose anything Jerry's strategy would be if there's um, for instance like the the father of the bride is about to see his daughter and there's gonna be like a little reveal. He'll go up and he'll coach the father like, hey, this is like, this is the last time you're gonna see your, your daughter like before the wedding day. And he'll put some like messages to unlock extra emotion into the father of the bride's ear uh, before that moment happens so that like more of a moment happens. That's not something that I'm comfortable doing um, that I just let things happen as they do. And then I document kind of however that goes down. So it is best I tell all of my couples in the first meeting, I tell all of my couples really as much as I can that like 90% of the day always candid, but I'm happy to step in during family for family formals to get everything that I need um, done quickly. Another thing that I abide by everywhere is to remove stress from the wedding day. I think removing stress means essentially just not creating more stress that I know that there's, I've seen like a lot of photographers and a lot of maybe not specifically photographers but a lot of other vendors that just come in with problems like if somebody comes in and they're like the flower like whatever it is like just don't don't tell the bride and the groom specifically maybe the groom don't tell the bride tell the bridesmaid tell her mom like figure out a way to make it not stress out the bride on the wedding day um however possible the other i guess good thing that we work with a lot of great venues now so those venues really kind of have all of that unlocked that they know that like if there's a problem they'll tell the bride but they'll tell the bride like three days from now after the wedding um and they'll just solve it on the spot so if you're able to solve anything just make that make that stress go away and try not to add stress don't come in and don't be stressed out don't like bring problems to them if you only have 15 minutes to get couples photos done and you have to do it in blue hour rather than golden hour just get it done um, and just like work a little bit harder and figure it out and problem solve on your own rather than um, coming to them with any problems. Um, don't make anything, don't make anyone do anything weird. I feel like this is a thing that a lot of us maybe did in the very beginning that we'd always like see these poses. We'd be like, oh, like, yeah, like you should get up on that fence and like, yeah, you should be standing over there and get up on that hay bale and 
um, whatever it might be, I feel like to make people do weird and challenging things that they're kind of like, oh, I don't know if I can do that in a wedding dress. I don't ever want them to have to question that. I just want it to be easy and organic. If they come up with the idea and they're like, hey, we want to climb that tree, um, by all means, whatever they want to do. But I'm not going to put it in their ear to try to suggest to them to do something that's out of their comfort zone just for me to hopefully an image that um, at the end of the day, I'm only really 80% sure that any of my ideas will ever work. So to make people climb a tree for to be 80% certain that's going to be a good shot. I don't know. Um, I would rather them just not do that. Dress professional. Uh, this is a thing that I've noticed maybe not so much anymore, but a bunch of years ago, it was usually either video teams or big like photography teams. So if you're working, if you're like subcontracted by a studio or if you're working for a studio in Toronto that has like 150 wedding photographers that all go out, that people would show up to weddings. Like, I don't think I'm poorly dressed right now, but like, jeans probably shouldn't be worn at a wedding um, unless the groomsmen are wearing jeans and even in that case I probably still wouldn't um, like dress shirt tuck it in like don't wear a short sleeve dress shirt unless it's like really really unreasonably hot outside uh, my one I guess exception to that is if we're at a destination wedding or we're down south so if you're a photographer and you're in very hot situations outside um, also read the venue so if you're go if you're showing up to like a black tie affair um, maybe it's time to just suck it up and wear that long sleeve in the hot 40 degrees Celsius sun that day um, and just drink lots of water and bring a few extra Gatorades in the trunk um, to stay hydrated. But I think that it is important to dress professional. And that also comes down to footwear, like wear shoes that like look nice. Um, if you find them, so in, if you're in Canada, there's a company called Softmock and they have dress shoes that are also running shoes. So they look like a dress shoe and then they just feel like a running shoe. So if you can find those or you can find any version of them anywhere in the world, um, that they do exist and they did not exist, I'm going to say like five years ago. So if you can find those, awesome. Otherwise, just dress shoes. Um, and then, yeah, just kind of suck it up, I guess, a little bit. I don't wear a tie um, unless it is a black tie formal affair. Um, so make sure that you just kind of know what you're getting into. I would say if you're getting into a black tie affair style wedding, you would very much know before you actually get into it. So um, just be aware, dress professional. Um, if you want to wear like a little logoed polo tee or whatever, that's totally fine. I just like kind of dress, like white dress shirts and um, blue dress shirts. And I have one shirt that I used to wear a lot because it helped me focus on the back of my camera when I didn't have a flip LCD, but I don't have to wear that shirt anymore. We'll get over that. We'll stop. Tim's Tim's laughing at me because he knows how many, I, I, have three or I have three versions of that shirt in my closet right now and I've worn them I'm going to say like a hundred times each. I had to get three because I shoot a lot of triple weddings in the hot summer. And if you wear that shirt on a Friday, you do not want to wear that shirt on a Saturday and you do not want to wear that shirt again on a Sunday. So get three shirts if you find a shirt that you really like. Um, bring backups of everything. So that means uh, for me, that means having a second or another additional backup piece in the car as well. So that for whatever reason, if something happens to you and like all of your stuff goes missing and you're held at gunpoint or whatever silly thing it might end up being, um, that you have an additional backup somewhere else. Um, I also kind of offset this to my second photographers that if they come with a bunch of extra stuff, I kind of count that as partial backup gear as well, as long as I would be comfortable using it. Um, and then the other bonus that comes with the second photographer usually and one of the reasons that I typically, Tim knows this, that we usually drive separate a lot of the time um, is because I like to have a backup car as well or a backup human that can go out and get something if it needs to be done or if I run into car trouble on the way to the wedding or whatever, that at least they're not going to be stuck there with me. Um, that is the thing that I guess like maybe is an unnecessary thing, but I think it's kind of important to over-prepare and to just face less problems. I do not believe in the fact that like that you have to experience problems in order to solve them and learn from them that you can just never experience problems if you don't want to. Um, another thing is to discuss all the terms of the actual wedding before the wed wedding day, which means have everything in the contract. And when you restate and you ask them for that final day of schedule, make sure they know how many hours you're there. Make sure they know when you're planning to depart. Make sure that they know when you're going to arrive, where you're going to arrive, and really make sure all of those details are 100% crystal clear um, so that there's no like potential that anything could go wrong with timeline or with them being like, oh, we thought we had you till midnight. Like We have a sparkler send off. Um, just make sure you know everything and that everything is very clear before the day. Um, arrive very early. I'm, I would say typically... I triple the time. So if I have to drive a half hour, I'm usually leaving my house an hour and a half before I have to be there. So if it takes half hour, maybe it's not necessarily tripling. I guess it is tripling. Um, but I add pretty much an extra hour so that I just sit there literally in the parking lot um, for like an hour before the wedding, just because I would rather be there that early than experience any sort of drama on the way. Again, you don't have to experience problems in order to learn from them. Um, so arrive early. Have ideas on your, um, any, any list. So if you're 
stressed out about like, oh, I'm going to forget like this photo, this photo, whatever it might be. Um, if you just have that list on your phone or you have a printout of the list, which is probably a little bit better. So you're not just like constantly referencing your phone throughout the day. Um, if you have that on your phone, if you have images on your phone that if you're just like stuck for poses and you have an extra 10 minutes to fill, you're like, ah, like, what do I do? I think there's nothing wrong with just having a few that you can just quickly flip through on your phone to make sure that you can just like, that you have something to do with them and you have that inspiration again. Because I feel like even myself that after, I, I feel like everything is so efficiency based with me that as soon as I hit the end of the line, um, that I don't really have anything extra. So if we have an extra 10, 15 minutes that we can go do stuff, but I would rather kind of like take even 20 seconds to just be like, okay, like, this is what we'll do. We did this shot here two years ago. We'll do a variation of it. Um, try not to copy what you've done in the past or what other people have done, but um, just come up with different versions um, of what you've done in the past and what works. And I feel like that's all wedding photography. Just carry forward whatever works last week and make next week a little bit better. Camera settings, manual, aperture priority. Um, this was, I guess, for me as a hybrid shooter, so speaking as a photographer, I feel like the main benefit to shooting App or to the main benefit to shooting manual is just to have full control over everything you're doing. So when you get back into post-production, everything is just fast that you have that white balance. It's all the same. You have that, sh like that exposure, everything is the same and you can just sync corrections across multiple photos. Um, I found that that speeds up dramatically in hybrid coverage specifically. Uh, it, I guess becomes even more challenging um, to shoot something like aperture priority because if you're shooting video and your white balance is changing or your ISO is ramping up and down because you're on auto ISO, uh, it really just kind of ruins the, the professionalism of a video. So you pretty much have to shoot manual everything if you're shooting video. And I would recommend it just for speed and efficiency in post-production. Not necessarily to be cool and to tell everybody that you shoot manual and you're not a photographer if you shoot aperture priority because if I'm just taking a walk around town or if I'm out traveling, I'm usually on aperture priority. Um, and then if you're shooting mirrorless, it becomes even easier to shoot manual because you can just see pretty much what you're doing in most circumstances. Uh, raw versus JPEG. Um, this shouldn't really be a thing anymore. When I guess back at the beginning of this, this video series, I talked a little bit about how I used to shoot concerts. And at that time, in like 2003, 2004, it was very expensive to buy memory and I shot JPEG because I literally couldn't afford to shoot raw in a situation that required me to shoot more than like 50 photos at a time. Uh, now memory is so inexpensive. So just get big fast cards and just shoot raw on everything that it's going to save you so many times in wedding photography and you're just gonna have so much more data to pull from and to just create better images. Um, that said, I do shoot everything raw plus JPEG. So that means that I have a JPEG backup of everything and I use that as an online backup. Um, and also just announced Canon has released uh, basically it's like unlimited cloud storage or that's what it appears to be. I don't know if it's officially out yet, but it's unlimited cloud storage for all of your raw files, which is like industry changing, I would say, for wedding photographers, that you can just literally upload all of your raw file. I don't know how long they stay there. That would be something I would check into, but for at least like before you deliver the final images from the wedding day, to have everything backed up online for free is really, really cool. And it's like, quite honestly, almost like a reason, I know I said not to switch camera systems before, but if you're about to buy into something and you know you're gonna spend a lot of money, that that is kind of a key feature, that that's like a, wow, that's a very nice to have feature, um, rather than just, I don't know, paying for Dropbox or whatever it's going to be and capping that out to just have unlimited storage for all your raw files. Sounds pretty awesome. Hopefully the other camera companies um, get along with that as well. Um, the other benefit of shooting JPEG is that you just have that JPEG instantly on your phone. So if you want to post something during dinner of the wedding or um, in certain circumstances when I'm shooting family photos or if I'm shooting an engagement session that I will simply just edit from the JPEGs because I know that I have full control over the situation and I can make everything look exactly as I want it to. Um, on my Nikon camera, I specifically shoot D lighting on high. Um, D lighting basically pulls down shadows so you don't really overexpose too much um, in skies and whatnot. And then it bumps up your, or, yeah, brings down highlights up shadows uh, and kind of makes a more HDR without it feeling HDR, high, high, high dynamic range, um, without it really just feeling too overly HDR. Um, so I find that the way that it processes, this is really all Nikon cameras going back to even the D750. Uh, everything that comes off of there as a JPEG is almost ready to go, as long as you take the time and attention to get the white balance right. So in any sort of situations, like if I'm shooting 10, uh, actually this will be a Patreon video um, that's part of this course, that 
if you're shooting like 10 back to back family sessions because you sold way too many gift certificates because you got a little too ambitious and you ran out of money in December, um, that you can do 10 back to back sessions and you can process them incredibly quickly if you're just editing from JPEGs and you're getting everything right in camera, that it really does minimize your um, your extra time that you need to spend on just like moving small sliders. So yeah, nothing but good things to say about shooting JPEGs specifically with um, Nikon cameras, specifically newer Nikon cameras. All right, a walkthrough of a typical day. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a bigger section. So I arrive usually, as I said, quite early, um, unreasonably early even. I sit there. I If you want to look through your your list of photos that you need to take or whatever it might be, or some last minute inspiration, this is a good time to do that. Uh, I arrive, I would say my typical wedding day is one hour before the bride um, or grooms, depending on style of the wedding, um, before everybody gets dressed basically. So I get an hour of getting ready coverage. Usually when I arrive, if everything's that one spot, I'll go in, I'll do all the venue shots first so that I know that I have those. Um, I will start those in that free hour that I'm there. Um, so even if I start before my time, I don't really care too much. Um, I'm kind of theirs for the day and I'm not too sticky on the exact hours, I guess, that I work. So if I'm there, I'm just going to shoot all the details, get that done so that I don't have to kind of do it in the crunch time or I don't have to get my second to go and do everything in between cocktails and um, and when everybody sits down for dinner. Uh, I go and I get my getting ready shots every year. I notice that brides, or at least my brides, again, like you're like whoever your ideal client is, you're kind of shooting their weddings over and over again. Um, I have discovered that my brides care less and less and less every year about two things. One is engagement shoots. I feel like I do 10 less engagement shoots every single year. Uh, and the other thing is that they just don't care too much about detail shots. And I think depending on your motives um, that to get published, which we'll talk about in the Patreon section, um, to get published, it really does, you need a lot of detail shots that they do not care who the couple is, like that wedding magazine. All they want is detail shots and more detail shots if possible. Um, so by overshooting details is something that you're kind of doing for yourself selfishly. So if I'm doing that selfishly, I will arrive a little bit earlier to make sure that I have my own time to get that done. So I don't have to just um, like make the bride get shots that she doesn't really want on her own time. Um, usually they just want a couple photos of them in robes or whatever, just like hanging out, having mimosas in the morning. I am totally happy to get those shots. And then also just being there an hour early, I don't just fly in and just like immediately start gra grabbing like up close photos of everyone that that just is terrifying. I think for this random stranger to enter the room with cameras and just like start taking photos. So what I do is I'll like, I'll go and I'll shoot the rings over here and I'll be in sight of everyone, but I'll just casually take some photos, um, so that I'm not stressing anyone out too much. Um, the live stream to this day. So. All right. I'm going to put the other AirPod in. I think my AirPod just died. Hold, please. Still going. Yeah. All right. Put this AirPod in and hopefully this is functioning. Let Tim know if this is not functioning um, in the comments right now. Still working? All right. Okay, cool. Um, I heard a very loud noise in my ear. So I get there early. I start doing photos in a place that is just visible to everyone uh, so that I'm not just this unknown stranger just in the room just taking photos and stressing them out. Um, and then I slowly work my way into doing candids. Again, I'm usually almost always on my 85 millimeter lens and I can be from here to a good distance from anyone. So they like, I'm not shooting on a 7200. I'm geared down kind of smallest possible thing. Um, I'm talking, I'm interacting a little bit and then also just grabbing candids as things happen. I would say it's kind of challenging to get really, really amazing getting ready coverage shots and um, the thing that stresses me out is that that is the way that specifically a video begins and specifically their wedding gallery also begins. So for, I guess, to add extra professionalism to the very beginning in a video, the easiest way is that you just open it with a drone shot. And I know it's a cliche, but it really adds like next level professionalism right off the start. And you know, I guess, a level of quality to expect. So if you see like five awesome drone shots or even venue drone shots for photography, um, that if you see those shots, you're like, okay, cool. And you'll be a little more forgiving if the getting ready coverage is in a room where the lighting is just nuts and you just can't do the best possible coverage in it. Um, obvious best case is that you show up to a room and it's like the studio that everything is just reflective and bounces good light. Um, but I would say maybe once a year that happens that I end up in a room that's actually like 
ready to go for a professional photo shoot. The other times I'm always just kind of making do with whatever I can, whatever I can do. So um, don't stress out too much, but find a way to pad it at the very beginning to make it a little bit more professional looking overall. Um, moving into the rest of the day, from that point on, I'm pretty much candid until we do the actual family photos. So we'll typically go from there and we'll move forward into um, just kind of like almost transitionary shots with the with the bride and groom or whoever groom and groom bride and bride as we're moving somewhere um, I think it's important to get the transition shots and then to get that reestablishing shot at a different venue uh, to make sure that you kind of have the complete story and these principles stay true whether you're shooting photography coverage only or you're shooting video I think they're both um, it's it's good practice for both um, another thing that I focus a little bit on is that if I'm in a situation where I can shoot a wide angle lens that I will shoot my 85 shot, I will shoot a wider shot and then I will shoot an extra wide shot. So basically it's kind of, I guess like the filmmaking generic guideline is that you want that tight close up, you want that mid shot and you want that wide. Um, with video, it's nice to have those to choose from. With photos, I think everything, um, as I spoke to primes versus zooms, that everything just kind of has a purpose and everything feels like it, it has a reason to be there when you do shots like that and you're not just kind of rolling back from like 70 to 65 to 60 um, and making kind of that gradient transition that if you're at 85 and then you're at 24, that both of those frames both belong. Um, and even if you give somebody a lot of images in a gallery that like it, it still feels, it still feels good. It doesn't feel boring. Um, from there, we'll either go into a first look and if we're going to a first look, I'll be on my 70 to 200. Um, and usually Tim or whoever my second photographer is, basically I'll, I'll be there um, over the bride or whoever's walking, I guess, up to the scene. Um, I'll be over their shoulder and then whoever turns around is the one that I'm usually photographing. Um, if it's same sex wedding, things change a little bit. Um, but usually traditionally, if it's bridegroom wedding, the bride is usually walking up and just kind of like being the one that's in motion. Um, so I'm always on the groom's reaction, just logistically, it's easier to move somebody usually, um, I guess like it, it creates a better sense of movement um, if the bride is walking up and there's a dress and things like that. Um, so in that circumstance is when I will use just basically my 7200 to get that reaction shot as they turn around. If I'm shooting hybrid coverage, usually I will get the video of them actually turning and I'll quickly switch to photo and I'll grab all the still frames that I need. Um, and that's never really a problem. And have the motion of somebody turning is usually even if like they turn and they're obstructed or whatever it might be like stuff never works out exactly as you would expect but even just to have the beginning motion and then to cut to a reaction shot in video um or to cut to something completely different it works really well i think overall so um that's where i am and then tim is usually on whoever's approaching um over their shoulder kind of getting that reaction um, moving into the ceremony, everything is completely candid at this point. I'm on my 7200 most of the time with my 24 or 35 over my arm. Uh, I want one or two wide shots, but most of the coverage is all just going to be documentary as things happen. Um, so I am just spending all of my time then just simply documenting and moving into family photos. I am, I would say most of the time on my 7200 still, um, simply because it's not so much a problem for guys. Um, it's a big problem for girls if you're a female shooter is that like just nobody will look at you. Um, and we've seen this with all of our friends that if you're the female lead photographer, people will come up to your second photographer that's a man, like a dude and they will talk to them and they will not address you. And it's it's dumb and it's stupid, but the, the easy way to work around that is just have a big stupid camera, um, to have that big lens on there and you'll just get a little bit more eyeballs in your direction. Um, I find that just by having that lens, Everybody just knows who the photographer is instantly. So it makes it a little bit easier. Um, moving forward from there, we will typically, either myself or Tim will go do cocktails. If I have time, I will go do some cocktail coverage. Usually it's Tim roaming around or my second photographer roaming around. Um, as far as video clips go, we're just kind of shooting again the in-between moments and we're not necessarily photographing um, or we're not getting video clips of absolutely everything that's happening at cocktails because we've discovered that we don't really use a whole lot of that. Maybe one wide shot to set the scene. Uh, but we don't use a whole lot of it and we don't include random strangers. So one of the photo video boundaries um, for us is that anyone that is the prime family member, anyone sitting in that front row of the wedding is typically somebody that can actually appear in the highlight film. Um, but the people that I guess don't appear in the highlight film are just all the other guests that I won't just include a straight close up of somebody um, because that's going to end up being like the date of somebody or that like somebody and they broke up or whatever it might be. And that's going to be a requirement for me to go back to the project and do a re-edit and re-export and everything. 
um, which I would rather not do. So if I can just include only key family members, uh, it's usually the best way to go about that. So um, for photography, we grab candidates of absolutely everyone that it's easy enough if that ends up happening that they can just go to the next photo or they can delete it from the, um, I don't know, like the folder on their computer or whatever it might be. Um, it's a little bit easier that way. So moving forward from cocktails into getting or into um, the actual, I guess, reception when everybody sits down is usually the time that I'll go back onto my 85 and for entrances and everything like that, depending on the room, I might go a little bit wider just to make sure that I can get everything. Otherwise I'm just on my 85 and I just roam around um, unless I am in a circumstance that requires me to go to my 7200, which I would say if it's a big room and there's maybe like 20 tables and if I'm going to shoot at 85, if I'm going to have to be in front and blocking the views of grandmas and whoever it might be, um, I'll be on my 7200, but otherwise I am much happier on my 85. Um, and just for speeches and everything, like I think the best spot to be for speeches is down at the end of the head table that wherever their line of sight is going, if they're talking over here to the bride and groom, um, that you kind of want to be on that line of sight that if you're out this way and they're talking like this, but they're constantly making their best reactions to somebody over there, you want to be in line of sight over there. Um, so that's kind of where I post up most of the time. And also depending on backgrounds, if it's a good background, um, I'll maybe lean into it and I'll spend a little bit more time there. But if it is a bad background, um, it's a lot more likely that I will just kind of, um, I don't know, figure out whatever is the best possible situation within that environment. Uh, and then into dancing, I will usually use an off-camera flash for dancing and I will just put it up against a wall or something if it's like a, a light gray brick or something like that, just to have that nice light on the dance floor. And then I will just kind of, again, roam around, get all the shots that I want, again, focusing on those key people. Um, end of the night, leaving is always awkward. It's always a bit of a challenge. Again, this is why it's important to have all the terms discussed before the actual wedding day so people that they know to expect that after like the first dance, you're gonna come up and you're gonna say goodbye. Um, so they'll hopefully have a little bit of a list to be like, okay, cool, like, can we do one last photo with like this person that we didn't get whenever? Um, but otherwise, usually it's, um, that's the easiest way to kind of say goodbye um, rather than just kind of like lurking on the dance floor and trying to like run in whenever you feel like it's, it's always gonna be awkward, but for them to know exactly kind of when you're gonna be leaving and just like quickly walk up, usually you'll catch their attention out of the corner of your eye and they'll be like, oh yeah, you guys are done. All right. Have a good night. Um, so yeah, that is kind of the entire walkthrough of, I guess, a wedding day at a high level. Um, and we're going to go back to Tim for some questions. I feel like I just talked for a little while there. Got some great questions here, Taylor Jackson. All right. Tim off, has the great questions. First off, there's a few bots out here causing some disruptions. So there's some bots? There's some bots like reposting things. So we got, we got bots. We got bots. So after this round of questions, I'll go through and I'll block them. Okay. Their minds, Grab your... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. All right, um, cool. Uh, question is from Natorium Solorin. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Do you think that a wedding photographer needs full frame camera or can a beginner get away with crop sensors and primes? Yeah. Um, so the question is Do I think that somebody needs a full frame camera to be a wedding photographer or if you can get away with crop camera for a while? And I think that anyone that shoots Fuji will wholeheartedly agree that crop cameras are totally fine. Um, depending on how you're using them, I guess, that I don't think that there's a right or a wrong. The thing that, the reason that I, I guess, like shooting specifically full frame cameras is because I like the lenses that I spoke to in the beginning of uh, this course is that I love the look of that 24-1-4 wide open with the full frame of it, um, which means that all the kind of the nice vignetting and all the things that are defects, uh, I actually like as characteristics in the lens. So the reason I like to shoot full frame is simply to use those lenses. If I didn't have that preference, if I didn't really love that and enjoy that, then I would have no problem just shooting crop. Um, I feel like if you're a Fuji shooter, you're going to be totally happy shooting APS-C all day long because all like everything is geared towards that. Um, one thing that I would, I guess, suggest is that as you book more and more weddings to just invest in better glass and a lot of the systems at some point, you won't really be able to get great glass for the crop sensor versions or of their cameras, which is great for Fuji because Fuji designs everything for crop, but something like Canon or something like Nikon, um, their APS-C lenses just aren't going to be opti optically as good. And then to put a full frame lens on that, um, you're kind of only, you're not using the full lens. So um, some things to think about, but no, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. All right. Yeah. Um, Jacob TKL. Jacob TKL. Has invested a lot of time and money energy into uh, gear to carry, like straps, basically, yeah. to carry his stuff. 
um, he finds he's not really using them anymore. What's your experience with, with carrying, carrying camera straps? What is my experience and or suggestions, I guess, for carrying cameras and gear? Um, I have a Peak Design Everyday Messenger. Um, I have the Everyday Backpack for travel, but the Everyday Messenger, I basically limit myself to whatever can fit in there. So I only bring, as I've spoken to a lot in this course so far, is that like I have one camera with me that's usually on my side or in my bag. And then I have my main camera that never leaves my hands. Um, and on that, I have a 24. Sometimes I have that 35 Tamron if I need a either if I'm shooting hybrid or if uh, I need a macro lens on the day. And then I have my 7200 and that's really all I bring. So I have that in a bag and then I have a Peak Design, the, I forgot what it's called, the mini, whatever the mini strap is, mini slide. Um, I have that because that's more than enough um, to I don't know, keep me happy. And yeah, I have those two things. So I have like one, one strap on that camera, one on my regular camera that I use all day. And then I have my messenger bag and that's really about it. Um, yeah, outside of that, I try to, again, like keep gear minimal. And I think that's kind of the way that I've done it. Great. Cool. Next question, uh, Tim. The Viso Matoba, sorry if I'm butchering <laughs> um, Since the Sony has a problem with buffering, uh, how is the buffer of your shoot running? Uh, this is a buffer question yeah. for uh, hybrid shooters. And the buffer on Nikon stuff is awesome. The original reason that I actually got the D5 was because the buffer is just so fantastic there um, that I was just like totally, it was worth the switch to go to the XQD cards at the time. It was more expensive, but, um, and it was also a less optimal camera body for recording video because the screen didn't flip at all. Um, but the buffer was awesome. They carried all that tech forward to the D850, um, which I love. And now it's all in the D780. I think the D850 is still a little bit faster if you're shooting medium raw but the D780 comes with a few other features for video creation that um, are, are very much nice to have. I'll take the maybe quarter, half second delay um, to have things like autofocus that actually works properly in video. So yeah, um, Sony, we'll do a video with Liam uh, next week about how to, I guess, troubleshoot and how to, how to work a little bit faster and how to make it actually work for you if you're shooting Sony for uh, hybrid coverage in a fast paced environment. Uh, one final question here, Taylor. Uh, one final question. Oh, two more questions. Two final questions. Um, Beauregard family wants to know, are you pushing for first looks this season? Ooh, are we pushing for first looks this season? Um, what do you like about first looks? I, I don't really push either way. I think it's kind of whatever, I guess this kind of goes back to what I spoke to you at the beginning, that however they envision their day, I don't want to have any specific input into changing it too much. So if they want to do a first look, I'm happy to do that. If logistically it just makes sense to do a first look um because of the way the day lines up usually um i would say that's the only time that i would suggest nicely that we do one um if if it's just a regular day and it works either way i just have no preference for them um, which is both positive and negative i guess because now they have to actually make a decision and um that <laughs> decision impacts your wedding which some people are afraid of uh but i would say not really 50 percent of the time i'll do one and if it works out, awesome. The thing that I, I guess it also depends on day of year, day of the year too, that during summertime, I would almost rather that we do photos after the ceremony. And if we do a first look, we're going to spend a lot of time out in the middle of the like 2 PM sun, which isn't ideal. Uh, but moving into September, October, November, when it starts to get dark really early here, um, at that point, I might maybe casually suggest that, Hey, sunset time is your ceremony time. So if you want daylight photos, we're gonna have to do them before. Um, so that's the time that I would suggest it, but for the most part, um, I have no preference necessarily on it. Um, I think, I don't know, we, like Lindsay and I did a first look. It was great. It worked on the day. Um, but I think it would have been, I think it would have been kind of like great either way. So I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, I think, overall. So um, if your couples or clients are ever confused that, I don't know, there's no right or wrong decision. And then final question is there um so after this is live the first seven videos are all going to be um so basically we're on like video what three of four so. <laughs> big day yeah. tim's uh tim's adjusting the camera um so the first seven videos are all going to be on youtube and then the remaining seven videos <laughs> we're good. <laughs> going handheld, going handheld. Um, so the first seven videos that we're kind of getting through right now, all going to be on YouTube and then all of kind of the business stuff with the exception, there's some that kind of dabble into business, but the, um, I guess the, the harder stuff that 
if it was to go in, on YouTube and everyone started using it in your area, all, everything would just become ineffective. Um, all that stuff gets locked down so that nobody, like the 15 people in your area aren't gonna be using the exact same tactics and oversaturating the tactic to not function anymore. Um, yeah, so some will be up here, half will be on Patreon. Cool. cool. I think I got time now up here. <laughs> Tim's trying to block uh, block the bots. One more Lucy. Is she still here, everyone? Tell me if Lucy's still here. Tim's trying to find bots. Uh, and then we're going to get to the next section. So the next section is going to be making 100K as a wedding photographer. Um, and, yeah. yeah. I think she's gone. Just the one. Yeah, you're good. We're doing the live stream off my phone. So it's uh, now Tim has to casually place this back in here without turning, pressing any of the buttons, or breaking, your phone. or breaking my phone, and also framing it. Oh, very nervous energy right there. Done it. -ish. All right, Tim says level-ish. All right. Um, this is, uh, I got my water here. All right, moving to the next video. Um, as I just kind of answered, um, that we're doing these seven videos. These are all going to be on YouTube. We're gonna do other cuts of them. We've got some cameras up here that we're doing. So it'll be a little bit more of a, I don't know, a polished version of it. Uh, but we figured we'd also do the live stream just in case you wanted to have this on the background, your work day or whatever it might be. Um, and these are all the videos that we're gonna be doing up here on YouTube. Tim's telling me to move over a little bit. Um, these other videos are all going to be available on YouTube. And then the next videos, these ones are all going to be on Patreon. So if you want to, I don't know, learn any of these things, um, feel free to hop over there. Basically, the I guess the situation is that if everyone started using these tactics right now in your local area, they would all become ineffective. So I locked them down behind Patreon. So only like maybe you, yourself locally or maybe like one or two other people in, if you're in a bigger city, um, start using things like that. So um, yeah, all these videos, 10K Instagram um, and specifically Instagram, and Facebook ads and kind of what everyone's doing wrong right now, as well as my updated uh, version of becoming a preferred vendor and all those other things. All right, on to the video. So how to make $100,000 as a wedding photographer. If you do 30 weddings per year at $3,300, roughly, I guess 33, 33, dot, dot, 33, um, you make $100,000. That doesn't seem outlandish. That seems totally reasonable that you can you could shoot easily 30 weddings probably this year. You're not gonna, if you're if this is your first year into it, you're probably not gonna start at $3,300, but that is a very reasonable goal. Um, if you live in at least a slightly larger city or you live anywhere near a larger city or you wanna travel for weddings, um, that this is a totally reasonable and attainable goal. Um, and I know that there's lots of the little dot down there that there are back-end costs, but for the most part, you can really minimize them. And if you're shooting 30 weddings a year, you can pretty easily probably just process everything in house. You don't have to outsource anything that you have to buy cameras and gear, but at the same time, you don't, you don't have to go out and buy like $15,000 in camera gear. You can simply get through with, especially if you're doing photo that you can get through with stuff that was great and it is still great a couple of years ago. Um, so I'm going to say like, even moving back to like the D750, I'm totally happy to shoot that camera still. And that is a camera that came out uh, over five years ago now. So um, to, worry about like getting the latest and greatest. You don't really need to do that. A lot of the good lenses, if you're fine with shooting digital SLR, or if you want to just go to something like a Sony a a7 III, um, shooting those cameras and those lenses that you can find some kind of cheaper versions of the things that like you could get the one four, but maybe for the first year, you're fine with the one eight and um, you can save some money that way. So while there are back end costs, I would say we do as wedding photographers really live in a profit rich environment and one without a lot of very specific costs. Like if I was to open any sort of shop, like a bakery or a restaurant or something like I would have hundreds of thousands of dollars of back end stuff that I would have to deal with. Plus I would still have to be trying to sell things and make profit on every single individual item. Whereas if you're running a wedding photography business, uh, specifically one that we'll talk to a little bit over this a volume centric wedding photography business, um, you're able to do a lot for not a whole lot of money. And the more weddings you shoot, the cheaper overall it comes to outsource everything as well. That if you have somebody either that'll actually come in and sit and edit your images or you go with one of the unlimited subscription services that are out there, um, a bunch of the bigger companies all use them um, or that you can use a subscription service. So it's like $199 a month 
for unlimited editing, um, which is what I use. And the more weddings you shoot, that 199 doesn't go up. That stays the same. So that's a very fixed cost, which is awesome. So um, there's not a lot of back-end costs, I don't think, that you still have medical. You still have, or I guess if you live in the States, you have medical. Um, and like there's a lot of smaller costs, but for the most part, we live in a pretty profit-rich environment. So don't let the back-end costs scare you away too much. Um, also, I guess like one thing, this might be out of scope of this video, but if you are a sole proprietor, small business, it probably makes sense at some point, especially if you're shooting 30 weddings a year to go incorporated. Um, tax savings, tax-wise, you'll just save a heck of a lot of money. Um, so by going to something that's an incorporation or an LLC or whatever it might be, wherever you live, you have a lot more tax benefits and you'll save a lot of money at the end of the year, especially under the current administration, because I guess things have been um, changed a little bit to to really prefer anybody that makes a good amount of money. Um, and then in Canada, we're getting a lot of trickle down of that as well. So um, I would much rather pay something like, I think for small business and corporations in Canada, um, I think the tax rate is 12% or something like that. It's pretty minimal, 12, 14%. It's pretty small. But if you were just taking that all as like your personal earnings, you might be paying somewhere up like 30 to 45%, depending on how everything goes down. So I'd rather take the small, I guess, tax rate. Um, I think the most important thing when you decide that you want to be a wedding photographer or you decide that you want to go for those 30 weddings and you want to you want to book those um, $100,000 worth of work is to prove first that you can actually book work. Um, I think that this is something that's very much overlooked that we, I spoke to this in a video a couple of days ago on, on Facebook or on YouTube. And basically it's that like, you have to prove that people actually want to book you and that they actually want to hire you before you like just start this business and you don't have to go through all the steps of starting a business and coming up with everything that you need to if you're not actually booking any work. So um, figure out if you actually can book, if you can actually generate business and revenue what in what you're doing. Otherwise, you can kind of refocus and there's lots of different avenues in photography. And if weddings are just simply impossible in your town because there's a studio that if there's like 15 studios that are all amazing and they're all doing exactly what you want to be doing, how do you compete with that? And if the only answer is to keep compete on price, it might make sense to just find something else temporarily to do some commercial work or to do some branding sessions or headshots or whatever it might be. So first up, prove that you can actually book work. And how I did that was I simply just went and took stock of everyone that was in my local area. And I was like, these people are all priced here. I would say that I'm roughly similar to some of them. And then I just priced below them in the beginning. And every single every single wedding that I would book, I would just step my booking price up by like $150, $200. And I basically just kind of built a business based on that, that at the very beginning, I was just, I wanted to get work, but I was very hungry. I was able to like, I, I wanted to work. I w would rather shoot a wedding. I would, looking back, I should have paid people <laughs> to shoot their weddings, which I know is a, a terrible business suggestion, but to build portfolio and to build experience, like I, I just wanted to work way more than I was actually working. Um, so that caused me to go on things like Kijiji and find free weddings and offer my services for free and to go and shoot things for people that didn't care about me that um, would even like in one case specifically, like they actually booked a second photography team, which is in retrospect kind of awesome because I just got to second shoot the day and they took all the all the liability of the day. Um, and I just got to shoot for my portfolio pretty much, um, which is kind of what I was there for was that when you're shooting a wedding for free, you're there selfishly, um, that it's not, they're, they're getting a free photographer, but you're there to build your portfolio. So um, in the beginning, that's what I did. And then as I started booking work based on my portfolio, the portfolio that I was generating for myself, um, that I was actively creating, because that's the most important thing, get to that a little bit more in one of the next videos, um, that I was actively creating these, these videos or actively creating this portfolio that I wanted to actually be shooting. And then at some point it gains enough traction that it starts getting those ideal couples to actually contact you and to actually book you. And at that point, your wedding photography business um, really just kind of takes on a life of its own and kind of brings you along for the ride a little bit rather than you just struggling every single day. So um, I stepped up my pricing every single wedding by just a couple hundred bucks. Um, and it was also gauged, I guess, that I was very versatile, uh, we'll call it, that if I got an inquiry and it was for a venue that I knew if I shot a wedding there that I could market like the crap out of everything um, that I would basically like take that wedding and do an amazing job of it, but also go in there and, and shoot it knowing that this was going to be my marketing material that I wanted to shoot more weddings here. Um, so I would kind of take that into account. So my pricing, I would come up with custom packages that wouldn't really make a whole lot of sense, but people were pretty happy to book. Um, all the marketing ideas that I have are all coming up in the Patreon section. That's going to be, um, it'll be released officially in March. So don't sign up right now, but if, um, but 
if you are watching the videos, not the live stream, um, that they should be out by the time you're actually seeing this video. So um, yeah, focus on booking work where and when it's possible um, is number one for me. And I don't think I realized this at the very beginning. So it's very important. Um, volume versus luxury. I think that a lot of the educational material out there right now is that you have to either be a luxury business and you have to be like that boutique studio or you have to be a volume based business and have a very low price point and to like just, I, I guess, shoot a lot of weddings for no money. Um, I think that you can do both. I think that nobody's really spoken to this a whole lot online, at least that I've ever seen. Um, I think that you can very easily do both, that you can be a luxury service provider, but also shoot a lot of volume. And that all comes down to stuff we'll talk about in Patreon, but it is pretty much just about making those venue and vendor relationships um, as solid as you can and knowing how to book them money because if you're booking other people money, they are going to look a lot happier upon you in order to, um, I don't know, like if, if, if they're putting together, the, like a venue is putting together their suggested vendors and there's five people on the list and you are the only photographer that has booked that venue weddings because of the marketing material you've generated for them. And maybe you've done a promotional video for the venue or whatever it might be. Um, if you are the one that's booking them work, if the general manager sees that you are the one that like is actually contributing to the bottom line costs and not just giving them Instagram images, they're probably going to rank you number one, or they're probably going to tell their sales staff or their sales staff might just organically like you and know about you more and better and promote you above everyone else. So it's like, it's step one to even get in the door, step two to get on the preferred list, but that still doesn't mean that you're just gonna have an abundance of work. But step three is that if you're able to just get everybody as your personal advocate, um, that's when you really start booking a lot of work. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a silly thing that I did a couple of years ago. Um, this was in, I think 2008 or no, 2018, 2018. Let's call it 2018, Tim. No? It was before that? 2016. Tim says this is 2016. Um, I thought it was 2018. Time, time just going so fast. Yes. So I did, I did a time sensitive um, holiday family session special. I was like, I'm going to sell some holiday session sessions this year. It's December. I'm not making a whole lot of money. I don't see when I'm like, I, I look at my calendar. And I'm not really making any money until like May. So I went really hard on the two days before Christmas here. Um, and I ended up selling 111 gift certificates for family sessions um, two days before Christmas, which is a lot. So you can price them out whatever you want. But basically what I did was a, like a time sensitive offer that it's available this day only. And if you want to, if you want to book, if you want a gift for your mom that you haven't bought yet, if you want whatever gift for whoever, um, that here is your one-step solution. I'll send you the gift certificate um, over email, like as soon as you pay, and you'll have that gift for somebody that's actually going to be awesome. Um, so within pretty much like a day and a half, I made $41,625. And that is a significant amount of money to make in one day. Um, there are methods to really kind of doing and creating a business that isn't necessarily only weddings, but all types of portrait and all types of commercial. And you don't have to publicly tell everybody that like, hey, this is, I, I do these. Because if you look anywhere online, you'll never see really anywhere with the exception of promotions that I do family portrait sessions um, because I only do them once a year. And because of that time pressure, they sell really well whenever I do um, launch one. So I made a video like kind of leading up to the day and just getting people excited to know like at 9 a.m. that there's only, um, I think I said 100 available. And within a couple of hours, it was just like kind of like absolutely exploded. So it was um, definitely a very positive thing and definitely taught me the time pressure, time sensitive sales are kind of the way to book more and more photography work if you want to book work. That if you're just available for portrait and wedding sessions, that's great. But if you have a time sensitive offer, you have a lot more, I guess, leverage overall um, about getting people to act quickly and to book things. So figure out what people need and put that in front of them and make it super, super easy. Um, there are lots of ways to, to structure sales. So, um, well, like if you're a wedding or a portrait shooter, you might think that $375 is a little bit low for a session if like you're giving away all the images and you're not doing like a sales session, you're not getting like the back end sales. Um, but there's lots of different ways to structure sales. So whatever kind of works the best for you. I like the idea of just having that one upfront price, making a very quick and easy, simple way to understand it, not selling packages and just kind of like going out, here's the files. Um, that makes me the happiest. But if you're somebody that wants to have a studio, you want the the family to come in and sit down and view their images on a big screen that you have control over the color 
that's awesome. Um, there's a lot of money to be made in that. I know a lot of family photographers and um, couples photographers that are probably making more than I make on a wedding in a single family session. And you can shoot that family session on a Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or all of the above. Um, there's a few of them in town here and there are a lot all around the States that do very, very exceptionally well um, as far as like after sales go. And I would say that some of them are in the ballpark of like five to six to $7,000 total um, for actual after sales, maybe even more, um, in some certain markets, but there are different ways to build your business. And if weddings, if you're trying to book them and they're just not happening yet, that there are different ways you can generate revenue while you wait. My goals overall, um, have always been, and will always be mostly time freedom. Um, I want to be able to go out and travel and do whatever I kind of want to do at the time. Um, so if I'm doing that, I, I'm pretty happy with my business. So Time freedom and business happiness overall is what I look for the most. So everything in my business, as you've heard, is really all geared towards happiness. Um, selling 111 family gift certificates uh, in one day, that sounds awesome at the time, but then you have to find a slot. Um, not all of them come back, so I guess that's a positive. But um, most of them, I would say, originally, like only 30 came back, I think the first half of the year. And then my September, October was just like, everything just came back. Um, so business-wise, great to have made money end of the year um really stressful to be one in prime wedding season and then two trying to get like 80 family sessions done um notice that that does not contribute to my life happiness my time freedom or my business happiness overall so um that is not a session or not a sale that i've done again since then and if i do do it i keep it actually controlled so i'll really when i say there's only 15 available there literally only are 15 available and um, they usually, I would say, sell out within maybe 20, 20 minutes maximum um, because people are like ready and waiting to actually book things um, if I'm releasing such a smaller version of them. And at that point, you can also kind of play the balance of pricing up versus, um, I don't know, like you have to find that line and it's always a moving line and it's a moving line every single year. So uh, yeah, those are my suggestions, how to make 100K as a wedding photographer, but also by supplementing by other things if uh, wedding photography just simply isn't working. All right, to the phones, Tim. Do you got some questions? We do. This one's from last time. I, I forgot to get to it. Stacy Jordan asks. Stacy Jordan asks. Any tips on how to do a Catholic wedding? They tend to be an hour plus, and sometimes the priest won't let you close to the altar. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, Catholic weddings. So I have struggled maybe three times and one Mennonite wedding where I have not been allowed to take photos actually in the, in the actual church. So I wasn't able to go in the actual space to take any photos. Um, there have been alternate versions of this where sometimes I'm allowed only to take photos of the processional and the recessional, and then I have to sit for the entire mass. Um, that's totally fine. It It's all out of your control. It's you, The couple will know prior to this happening that it's not going to be a surprise on the day that there's like no photos to be taken during the ceremony. They will know that that some things happened probably in the late 90s where a photographer got really out of hand and ruined it for everyone else that um, will ever take photos at that church. And until that pastor, um, reverend, or whoever it might be, um, passes his torch to the next person, um, that's probably going to be the way that it is. And there's really nothing you can do to argue your way out of it. Um, I think by being nice, dressing well, and just like showing up and being a nice, kind person, um, and going up and meeting them and shaking their hand, I feel like that's like a big step as well. Um, that if you're just, if you're nice to them, sometimes you get kindness in return. Sometimes you just get stone cold, like no photos, by the way. Um, which is something that hopefully you will know. And if you do end up there, you can grab some photos from the back if they're fine with that. Or sometimes um, one of the workarounds that I've discovered is that if you're doing video, you're allowed to video the ceremony, but you're not allowed to do photos. So you can just turn your camera on silent and just put it on a tripod or whatever and just be recording video um, and be taking photos. But you most of the time can't move from that spot. So maybe that's a workaround. Maybe that's a tip. But yeah, hopefully you know that before you actually get to the ceremony. And if not, like that just kind of, it is what it is. And a couple should know that. All right, next question, Tim. Russell Wright. Russell, Russell Wright. Uh, do you think the Nikon D4S is still a relevant camera for weddings? Do I think the Nikon D4S is still a relevant camera for weddings? Yes, I think, I'm trying to think. I shot a wedding with my friend Dave this Wait, year. You I have a friend Dave. Dave. Tim has... 25 friends named Dave. Um, and I think he was on a D4S and I prefer the color palette off the D4S to my current Nikon D850 and my current D780. Um, the colors and the way that my presets affected the colors, it 
everything felt better. So I think it's totally reasonable if you're not shooting video, um, like by all means, that that's still a totally professional and great body. Um, I feel like that's, again, the reason why camera sales are kind of down across the board is because anything that came out five, 10 years ago, or maybe, probably even almost 10 years ago, is still like great for photos, um, especially if you're outside or if you have good light or if you bring in strobes to kind of supplement where you understand that you just can't go above a certain ISO. Um, so just be conscious of ISO, but I think that's totally fine. I think it's a great camera. Great. All right. Back to Tim. A lot of people have been asking this. Um, maybe you're going to cover it later, but uh, who do you outsource your editing to? Who do I outsource my editing to? Um, I use a company. I've used a lot of companies. So I started with Shoot.Edit a long time ago, and they were great technically. I really enjoyed the images that came back. Uh, my issue, and I don't know if this has changed, this might have changed since, was that as a hybrid shooter, if I took the lead video role, um, my, my image spread, I would rely more on my second photographer to capture a lot of images. And they had a very hard policy. I think it was like that I had to shoot 70% of the images. And if I did not shoot 70% of the images, they would kick that job back. And that happened, I'm going to say, every other week for a long period of time. Um, and I essentially, I went through to, to fix the spread. I just included frames that I wasn't even going to deliver to the couple. So just like black frames or whatever at the start to make the ratio make sense, even though I'm making them edit stuff that I'm just going to delete. Um, but that was my workaround. I, at some point, found that that was just really dumb. Um, so I found another company. Um, I actually found another standalone editor and I shipped her drives and she was awesome. But the logistics of just shipping something physically is kind of quite annoying. Um, so at, after that, I went to a company called Evolve and they were, it was a, a rocky startup process, but it it's there now. Um, so in the past, I've been like, ah, let's try them out and see if they fit your style. But they've been good for me this year. Uh, Lindsay currently uses Photographer's Edit and they are fantastic image salon also um out of quebec in uh, canada like also absolutely phenomenal that i would say my my images they come back and there's something always a little bit wrong so but it's globally wrong so it's like everything is either a little bit too exposed and i can just do a global edit to bring everything down or it's a little too blue and i can just increase uh, white balance and make it a little bit warmer um to balance things around that way um Lindsay's images from photographers edit all come back like bang on. Um, image salon processes for a lot of the companies that you would rec recognize as probably like the best in the world. Um, and they are also fantastic, but they photographers edit and image salon come with a little bit more of a price tag. So as a volume shooter, I will just kind of go through everything after they've edited everything and work that out. All right, next question, Tim. Good question. Great answer. <laughs> Zexel1 uh, has a question. What's the best value marketing when first starting out, when you already have a portfolio, where should they invest their money in marketing? All right. Um, so best marketing when you're just starting out and you have a portfolio. Um, so you're very fortunate to have that. I would say best strategy would be to create actual helpful documents and tips to help people plan their wedding and to get that in front of them. And right now, at least locally, the best value that I'm seeing and also the least saturated specifically targeting wedding photographers is probably Instagram swipe up ads. Um, I would say that's like the easiest way to get in front of people right now. I know pretty much all of my clients are on Instagram. I would say maybe 50% of them are on Facebook now. So if I can hit them with swipe ups and um, actually deliver value to them, um, I think that's kind of the best case scenario. So always deliver value and don't just send people to your website to be like, hey, check out my work. Um, send them to something that can actually help them. And hopefully at that point, you'll at least create some sort of rapport or they'll at least stick around your website a little bit longer. All right, back to the phones, Tim. That's all we got for now. That's all we got. All right. Going on to, I told Tim this was going to be four hours total. It might be. Two, two more to go? Two, or? Yeah, there's a few more to go. We got a few more videos, Tim. Tim's excited. I can see it in his eyes. He's going to make another taco. I'm going to drink a little glass of water here. <clears throat> all right, well, Tim uh, goes and eats. I will... Um, I guess not begin this because I don't think we're recording up here, are we? Do you want to hit record and make yeah. make tacos? Oh, I feel like I've been talking a lot today. We've taped the live stream camera up and it's actually working really well. All right. We taped a mark here and I'm notoriously not staying on it at all. I'm going to switch back. Right. Let's sing a song, but I don't have any songs. I might actually have a music video coming out in like two weeks. We'll see. They go over very poorly with everyone, but we'll see. We'll try one more time, see if it works out.
Switch back uh, AirPods here. I'm curious if the AirPods are even connected. It sounds like they are.